might actually be the most derivative one of all. I mean, Christ, the same house. Maybe so. But you forgot the first rule of surviving a stab movie. Never answer the- I'm bored. Wait! Welcome back to Horror Queers. We're talking crushed velvet medieval gowns. We're talking 17-year-old Paul Walker. And we're talking testicular standoffs. And I'm Joe. And I'm Trace. And we're talking feeling a little flat today, Carl. Oh my god, I love that joke so much. <laughs> I love so many jokes in this movie. Um, everyone, we are discussing the forgotten but not 1994 classic Tammy and the T-Rex. Or Tammy and the Teenage T-Rex. Or Tanny and the T-Rex. Oh my god. I have a Blu-ray that has three different titles on it, and I don't know what to do with it. Like, if I was alphabetically organizing this Blu-ray collection, what would I do? I don't know, but I'm so, I didn't know you got the Blu-ray for this, and I'm so happy that you did. <laughs> oh yeah, I had to get that limited edition slipcover. We are not being paid by Vinegar Syndrome, but that is a very pretty box art. Oh god damn it, I didn't get a slipcover, but my, wait, is, is yours the 4K? Um, no. Don't no, okay, cool. Never mind. I got the 4K, so it's better. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, this movie in 4K. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, I watched the PG-13 cut of this, and it's like, you know, sourced oh. from a video uh, transfer or whatever the right. fuck. Honestly, though, I kind of liked watching it because it made me feel like I was in the 90s watching a movie on TV. Hmm. Hmm. I could see the appeal. Anyway, but okay, okay, well, let's bring in our guest because uh, uh, this person uh, loves this film and is actually the person that finally got me to pull the trigger on watching this movie. Um, everyone, he is a horror filmmaker based in L.A. Please welcome Eric Lawrence. Hello. 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 <laughs> Hello. Welcome to Tammy and the T-Rex. Oh my gosh, I've always wanted to be in Tammy and the T-Rex. <laughs> or at least since 2019 when they... Well, I, I was going to say, so had you heard about this movie before? And everyone, we will go through like the, the legacy this movie has. I'm sorry. We will go through the journey this movie has had to a wide audience soon. But yeah, did you know about this before that, that existed? So knew of it, had not seen it. My experience with it had mostly been like, th there are um, lists online mm -hmm. from like 2008, 2010, whenever they do these, they're like, 10 worst dinosaur movies no or like stuff like that and usually on those um tammy the t-rex or um what else like theodore rex carnosaur. Carnosaur, yeah yeah which all carnosaur is fine and people should lay off it <laughs> yeah and like and carnosaur 2 is even better that's like it's a whole other thing I feel like we've heard that, actually. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Whatever. I, I will say, Eric has gotten me to watch a lot of movies that I thought were going to be absolute shit based on their reputation. Hello, mm -hmm. Children of the Corn 3, Urban Harvest. And right. shockingly, not shitty. I mean, not great, but like, not shitty. <laughs> Tabitha, what do we think of Children of the Corn 3? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Children but, of the Corn 3 is really good. It is good. <laughs> They're all good. All, every single well, one of them. Even the Eric, new one, everybody hated. Eric. <laughs> we're going to have to ask you to leave now. <laughs> Don't say that, Eric, because then they won't take your actual good opinions on the, know, the third one I seriously. Know. And I know what the new one is, um, but I do still like it despite, or because, because mm -hmm. of. I mean, as we said on Patreon, take that edible and have yourself a good time. But yeah, we're not talking classic cinema for sure. No. <laughs> and also the Children of the Corns are uh, relevant to this because John Franklin is in Tammy the T-Rex. There we go. Yeah. It's full and circle. Queer. Oh, we've got a lot of queer stuff in this movie, mm -hmm. both in front of and behind the camera. It's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. It is a lot. But no, so, so when did you first see this? So 2019, when I didn't get to see it in a the theater, but everybody who saw the new gore put back in cut like mm -hmm. loved it immediately and i remember what did i do i asked for it for christmas from because my mom usually gives me like two or three blu-rays every year <laughs> and if i got it at christmas that means i could make my family watch it because we're oh. all together already and mm -hmm. we did and i think my mom had a fine time my dad read a book but my sister also really liked it and now she loves it as well and it was like a nice christmas movie and Eric is estranged from the rest of his family. No. They don't talk to him. <laughs> I, I, honestly, if I showed this movie to someone and they hated it, I might be like, I don't know if I want to know you it anymore. It would upset like, me a lot. Ooh. Like, I, I was pretty sure you were going to like it, and that is why we watched it. But I, um, yeah, no, that would be a big turnoff. And I've shown it to a lot of my friends, 
and they all like it because like why would you not well and, and to be clear everyone like i mean like by normal movie making rules this is a bad movie but <gasps> i but okay <laughs> <laughs> but, but heavy asterisks i find it so joyous and honestly the big surprise for me so yeah i i i was at fantastic fest when they premiered this gore cut or when they when they were screening at the festival circuit but i never do repertory screening so i was kind of like eh whatever i'll skip it i'll catch it eventually i just never did when you finally showed it to me eric what surprised me about this movie was the sincerity in it like yes this movie yeah. is dumb it's really stupid but there's also like a sincerity specifically from denise richards's performance mm-hmm. that really surprised me that one me like this movie has so much heart that i was not expecting it to have that's what made me fall in love with it's like i like the humor and what, like this is so stupid when we all watched it on christmas in that very funny scene where they play uh, charades or whatever mm-hmm. happens I started crying because Denise Richards sold the shit out of it, even though it's so stupid. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Like, she's in a completely different movie, and her movie is, like, a legitimate teen romance. That is the way she's selling it, and she's quite good in it. It's just that no one else is in that movie with her. She's also, well, it's interesting, too, because she's also the funniest character to me. She flips back and forth throughout. Like, she's very sincere. Oh, it's but wild. when she is snarky yes. or sassy, it's so, like, left field. It destroys me. So, Joe, then. So, this was your first time seeing this movie. And I am cautiously curious. What, what were your thoughts on this film as a first time viewer? Oh, this movie is dumb fun. It's very, very silly. But as you said, it's got a lot of heart. I didn't think it was going to be in on the joke. That's what took me Mm. by the biggest surprise. Like, there are moments here where you think, oh, maybe that's just not great filmmaking. But there's a lot of moments where everybody knows exactly what they're doing, except Denise Richards. Different movie. I think she knows. I think she's sincere, but I think she has to know. So I I will say, so uh, apparently Stuart Raffle, the director, he wanted everyone to play it very straight. Yes. And I only see that in Denise Richards and Paul Mm -hmm. Walker's characters. Right. Which would make sense because they're the two teenagers and everybody else is having just a wild time. I would also argue that, um, uh, is it, is it Byron is the best friend? Mm -hmm. Yeah. His dad is taking it all Oh, Sheriff Black? Yeah. Sheriff, (laughs) Sheriff Sheriff Black. (laughs) I know. It's very funny, but I find, uh, the, his relationship, their relationship, like surprisingly, sweet and kind of authentic and that he's like a little embarrassed of his son but it's not like he doesn't dislike his son he just doesn't want the other cops to make fun of him yeah he's not sending him off to conversion camp but he's also not waving a pride flag it's weirdly attentive, I think. Um, and not perfect, obviously. But, uh, it's 1994. Yeah. yeah. Well, but but that's the thing, right? So like, I can wave away a lot of the more of egregious like offenses of this character because it's 1994. But then the things it does right are made mm-hmm. better by the fact that it's 1994. Yes. Sure. Yes. Yeah. I feel very similarly about... Um, have you guys seen Revenge of the Nerds? No. Ooh, not in forever. <laughs> so, very problematic in how it treats women. Like, mm-hmm. that's kind of that movie's... Um, yeah, that's its whole thing. It's the raison d'etre. <laughs> it, it's what people point to, but how it handles its uh, gay character, Lamar, feels very similar, where, like, the jokes are just that, oh, he's very flamboyant, he's very effeminate, ha ha ha. But nobody ever laughs at him, nobody ever mm-hmm. makes jokes about him, like, the movie makes jokes, but the characters themselves immediately accept him and it feels very similar to this and i do tend to like it well that that's the thing too i saw some people complaining about the 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 two deputies who make some really dumb and horrible (laughs) gay jokes at byron's expense but again i never feel like the movie is Mm -hmm. making those jokes about byron it is if anything i think the movie makes it pretty clear that these two cops are assholes they're villains yeah did you guys watch the commentary no so i watched all the extra features except for the commentary I didn't watch the whole thing. I skimmed through it because it was all, it was a very, the director kept misremembering things Mm, and it stressed me out. (laughs) But but like, like he's, oh, okay. So the fun one, everybody talks about the fire throughout the whole special features. We'll get to that later. Yeah. So it's uh, some guy kind of interviewing the director and the producer. And he asked them if they ever worked with Terry Kaiser before, who plays the villain uh and they were like oh we saw him in weekend at bernie's and we liked him but he's the villain in mannequin too which, 
<laughs> literally, they direct it. Yeah, they were like, the director literally says, he was like, I've, I'd never met him before Tammy the T-Rex, but Mannequin 2 was like a few years before. It, wild. It's 1991. Yeah. Cocaine's a hell of a drug. Three years, right? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that really threw me through a loop. I'll tell you why. Well, I will say, though, because Denise Richards has an interview on this, too. Hers is fine. I mean, she's really good about coming into these, like, these new, like, uh, Blu-ray releases of her films. Like, I think she does a really good interview on Valentine. She's really good on Starship Troopers. Yeah. She doesn't have a lot of memories. Like, a lot of her recollections mm-hmm. of this film shoot were very vague. Yeah. The director had a lot of direction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I will say, though, the interview that I was surprised by... Was it the bully? Yes, the yeah. bully. <laughs> yeah, the guy that plays Billy, he... Uh, first of all, I was intimidated because it was a 25-man interview. And I was like, Jesus Christ, the guy it was the longest the movie one. that much. Yeah, it's the longest interview. It's longer than the director's interview. But he's really insightful on that interview. It's hmm. probably because this is his biggest movie. Probably so. Right. It's, it's his legacy. He's got all the memories yeah. because he didn't do much else. <laughs> well okay so l- l- let's talk about how this got made because honestly the story of how this got made might be the wildest thing i've ever heard in like film history <laughs> <laughs> or maybe the dumbest thing i've ever heard in film it's history pretty dumb. <laughs> maybe more the latter yeah <laughs> so okay wait. I am not familiar with any of Stuart Raffles' earlier works. I've never mm. seen Mannequin 2. Although oh, my God. Person. I know. I've heard, I've heard on the move is actually really, really fun. You've never seen Mac and Me? I've never seen Mac and Me. I've never seen The Ice Pirates. Oh, I saw Ice Pirates for the first time last month. Worth it? Um, It was weird. It was part of a 12-hour oh. 16-millimeter <laughs> film marathon. It was right mm. in the middle. So it's kind Ooh, of a that's haze. that's a tough slot. But it had this movie's tone and i didn't know it was the same director until this week and it put a lot of things in perspective for me that makes sense well and apparently that ending was the result of studio interference as well so it may not be the most accurate reflection of his work at least the ending it feels well it still very much kind of has like broad kid humor and surprising gore every now and then at least Hmm. it it feels similar in that way I mean, I, I had never heard of it, and then I saw that Angelica Houston was in it, and I was like, that's she is interesting. She so hot in it, too. She's beautiful. <laughs> Angelica. <laughs> God damn it, I'm going to go watch Ice Pirates. It's amazing. She, she's the best part by a lot. And she has like 10 minutes of screen time spread throughout. <laughs> but like every time she's on screen, it's like, oh, she's going to be a big famous star and nobody else right. here is. <laughs> well, okay, so Raffle was born and raised in England, uh, but he immigrated to America when he was 18, and he got a job at a ranch training animals for um, for Hollywood movies. So ever since turning 19, he basically had worked in films his entire life, but like he was never a one set job person. So he obviously his main job was an animal trainer, but he would be a boom man, a sound man, an electrician, cameraman, working from movie to movie to movie to movie. And he directed a couple of movies in the 70s, and they all pretty much involved animals. Um, he even worked on, but did not direct, the infamous cult film Roar, which I still, t- that's another one of those festival like repertory mm-hmm. screenings that I never watch, but I've always been curious about watching. Ooh, I've never seen it, but I don't know if I could just knowing the stories behind it. Well, is it because of the animals or is it because of the animals hurting people? I mean, both. (laughs) I I, I didn't know there was any animal cruelty on the set. I I, I knew all the the people getting hurt by the animals. It just didn't sound safe. So I can't imagine that the animals were being handled correctly. Can I just say there there is a lion in this movie as Mm -hmm. well. And in the commentary, (laughs) they were like, so did uh, Paul Walker ever come face to face with this lion? And the director was like, yeah, it was a trained lion, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the producer was like, well, wait, wait, wait. Most of the time the lion was with someone who was with the stunt person. And it was just like, (laughs) (laughs) did he know? Does he know? Nobody knows. (laughs) But but to to answer, I mean, to to respond to you, Joe, no, I don't think it was safe. Because to be clear, these were the pet lions of Tippi Hedren and that director. Mm -hmm. So like, (laughs) (laughs) like, they just happened to own a bunch of lions and said, let's make a movie out of it. And then Mm -hmm. like a bunch of people got hurt in the process. That seems to be how this filmmakers, like all of his films happen. Well, I mean, th- the fact that there's a lion in this movie, you're like, why the fuck? It's so convoluted. But then you're like, oh, right, because that's his he's an animal trainer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but even like McDonald's has some money to get a movie made. Oh, let's make Mac and me. Yeah, oh. sure. Yeah. 
I mean, this was a work for hire director. Yeah. Yes, very much so. Like these are all jobs. Well, and well, he wrote most of these too. So they're like, we mm-hmm. have an idea, and you have to write the like because the tone is pretty consistent throughout. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, now I'm gonna have to go watch Mac and Me. So thank you for that. Oh, you but... do. <laughs> <laughs> well, so his first major directing gig was 1984 science fiction comedy Ice Pirates, and then 1988 was Mac and Me. 91 was Mannequin Two, and then he follows it up with this. <laughs> so okay. The story of how this came to be. In 1994, this guy is in his house in Thousand Oaks, California. And I think he says the guy's name is Sal Louie or something. It may may rhyme with Sal Louie. I couldn't really, but the subtitles were not working. So this Sal Louie guy apparently owns a bunch of South American theaters and, you know, he buys movies and calls up Raffle and he's like, hey, I have a friend in Texas who has an amusement park and he wanted me to build an animatronic T-Rex that he's going to use in this park. I have the T-Rex for three weeks, and I want to make a movie. But we have to make it (laughs) within those three weeks. Also, it has to be less than a million dollars, because that's all the money that I have. Um, So let's write a script. And so... (laughs) Obviously, as you do. I just, like, you just... You happen to have a T-Rex, and you want to make a movie. And I guess this is what? This is after Jurassic Park, so dinosaurs are kind of the rage right now. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Carnosaur just came out, too. Well, yeah, that, that, that's probably the bigger influence <laughs> on this the... film. <laughs> <laughs> if they could make it for a million dollars, we can make it for a million dollars. So Raffle writes this script in a week, which sounds like a short amount of time. But honestly, every time I hear something like that, I always go back to Cabin in the Woods. Like, oh, they wrote it in three days in a hotel room. Yeah, good movies can be written in a week. They can also sure. not be written in a week. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like that's uh, the extreme end. Like, you could Pretty do it, much. but it's probably not advisable. Exactly. I'll also say Waxwork was written in a weekend, I believe. And Waxwork is the best movie ever. Good lord. How many times has that movie come on our podcast, Joe? <laughs> uh, to the point that somebody tagged us recently and was like, when are you going to cover it? It's pretty important. I can see where everybody's <laughs> Everyone, we will cover waxwork eventually, mm-hmm. I promise. Um, so yeah, so Raffle's wife hires a crew, because um, she's kind of the producer in the film, and like, she seems like the jack of all trades, to be honest. Mm-hmm. But they were like, okay, if we're going to do this, we're going to just film in a 20-mile radius of our house in Thousand Oaks, California. <laughs> so they did their own location scouting in this 20-mile radius and wrote the script around all the locations they picked. So they picked the locations first and then wrote the script. <laughs> Again, the way you want to do it. Oh, yeah. And this was a very low budget movie. I mean, again, less than a million dollars. I don't know the exact numbers. All I know is that it was less than a million. But like no one had their own trailer. There was one trailer that everyone cast and crew shared. (laughs) (laughs) This is yeah, this is uh, some real guerrilla filmmaking. Mm hmm. And, you know, Raffle is on record. He's like, you know, you have to write something within the parameters of your budget. I knew with this much money I couldn't make a serious horror film, even though the script apparently was very much tonally a horror film. Like, it wasn't cheeky. It wasn't funny. It was very serious. I guess during the process of it, he was like, the most forgivable thing in a movie, if you're making something bad, is humor. So you have to be on the joke and people will forgive the more shoddy elements of your film. So that's kind of how the tone and overall vibe of this film came around. But as I said earlier, he wanted Denise Richards and Paul Walker to play everything real and serious. And they do. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And the movie works because of that. I think a great call. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and he he was apparently very collaborative. Um, what, what, what did you say, Joe? He he directed actors well. I did not say that, but I would support that claim. <laughs> what was Denise Richards' quote? He directed. <laughs> he he directed a lot of direction. <laughs> <laughs> no, she she basically says you know he knew what he wanted, so he would tell you if you didn't have it, and then if he said that you did, that meant that he got it, and you could move on. Yeah, but but he was, okay, I'm going to use the word collaborative, but his mm-hmm. quote, and when I say his, I mean Rapples, he says he is the biggest plagiarist and would constantly ask the cast and crew if they had anything better to add in than what they were doing. Sure. <laughs> Make me uh, better. I, Make me better, 17-year-old kids. Who knows? I mean, honestly, though, like, why not? But sure. I will say Denise Richards, like, speaking on the film, I didn't 
get a lot from her interview, but she does have this little nugget that I love. And she says, you know, people get embarrassed when some of their past work is brought up. Uh, but I don't feel that way. Uh, even though Tammy didn't get a theatrical release, I had a lot of fun making it, and I really cherished the experience. And, you know, you could argue, oh, that's just a PR thing. Like, she's just speaking kindly because it's a new release, uh, a new, like, re-release or whatever. But I don't know. I just like that she looks back at this and she's like, yeah, I had fun doing that. Why not? <laughs> I fucking love it. My least favorite thing in the world. Like, every A-list actor ever has done a schlocky, usually horror movie. But usually horror, whatever. Yep. And ninety percent of them tend to rag on it, and in doing yep. so, usually rag on the whole genre. Yeah, and the fans, right? And the fans in low budget filmmaking in general, and it always leaves a very sour taste in my mouth. Yeah, just be proud of your origins. The reality is, this most of these actors have done it, so there's nothing to be ashamed of. Particularly if you say, yeah, I was young, like Denise Richards literally says, this was my first film. I was so excited just to be in a movie and I was trying not to get fired. Yeah. It's like, yeah, girl. Awesome. <laughs> cool. I, I am telling you, like, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure we talked about this on Starship Troopers. I'm sure we talked about on our Valentine audio commentary on the Patreon, but. Wild things. And, oh, yeah. Wild things. Shit, we've done a lot of Denise Richards. You did Drop Dead Gorgeous too, right? Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. 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 But we basically, we're done with Denise Richards after this, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Unless she comes back to horror girl <laughs> uh no i just you know i have so much respect for her as a person i don't know she, she just seems like a real trooper uh no she pun seems intended very kind i love the second any actor ever does anything like this i instantly stand them for life brian cranston coming on the alligator blu-ray like yes same thing i mm -hmm. anytime anybody does anything like that they they've got me good it's just endearing yeah it's 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 amazing so, okay, C coming into the actual drama of this film. So this was, as anyone who has seen the gore cut knows, this was originally shot as an R-rated comedy horror film. The gore scenes were removed from its initial American release in order to appeal to a family audience. Um, however, in other countries, such as Italy, it was released with these scenes intact. But then, like... <sighs> I don't know, like in the German, like, uh, sorry, in the South American release, there was a German or Dutch guy who financed the film, who re-edited certain aspects of it. Mm. I think that's why there's the typo in the R-rated cut that says Tanny instead of Tammy in the T-Rex. Um, right. It is fucking wild that it's correct in the VHS cut. Like, yeah, the, it's so weird. And that title card is pretty good in general. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, but it it's also <laughs> plays over a shot from the end of the movie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I like it. The font is fun and a rainbow. I, I will say I, I watched the PG-13 cut because I, I was like, OK, well, let's say I had a child in front of me. Could I show them this PG-13 cut and would it be like as effective or would, it, would I find it as funny? Um, hmm. It's weird. Because here's the thing. So it's eight minutes shorter. So literally, there's a lot of continuity errors because any scene with gore is cut out. So like John Franklin's death scene is not in the movie. So he is just... So he just disappears. Yes. Yeah. All of the cursing. And I'm not talking about just the fucks. Like every single bit of cursing is either muted or re-edited with like the coverage that they had. So mm. it makes the movie feel really, really, really wonky. And when they do mute the curse words, it's even painful. Like It, it feels like you're watching a TV edit. It right. feels a lot like that. It's also super... Uh, I'm very anti-censorship. I hate it. Uh, but if they were going to censor it, if they had taken out five more minutes, it could have been a kid's movie. Yeah. And this is they only went halfway. Like, it'll still cut back to the dinosaur with gore in its mouth. And people oh. do split blood. Well, no, th 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 that was my thing. So, yeah, after it eats uh, John Franklin's head, you know, he's picking the gore out of his teeth like, yeah. like, like with his fingers. <laughs> and so that, that part is in the PG-13 cut. And I'm like, what? Did I miss his death? Which I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure did. <laughs> Um, it's very strange as is. Well, and so it took, you know, 25 years. There was a very well-preserved copy of the R-rated cut of this film. Yeah. And they that's where Vinegar Syndrome came in. They did a remaster. Mm -hmm. It's on 4K. It did a festival run. Um, it didn't go to theaters. This Neither version of this movie. There, do you know if this went to VHS? I believe it went to VHS. It had to have been a very limited, like, number of releases, though. Because, I mean, no one that I know of has heard of this movie before then. There were a lot of weird kids movies in the 90s made by sleazy 80s horror directors. Mm -hmm. uh, like Jim Wynorski was making Munchie and uh, Charles Band, Full Moon. Like they made a bunch of kids movies. It was so strange. And I'd imagine this would be next to all of those. Yeah, th th this movie, I think the score for this has a couple of Full Moon score uh, uh, qualities to it. But I do think mm. it's a, a much better quality than most Full Moon pictures that I've seen. 
<laughs> it's oh the guy who did the score did doll man right that's yes oh yeah oh, oh and i i definitely own a blu-ray of doll man because i got it in a raffle at a horror convention <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, speaks highly uh i really i hate the music uh that, <gasps> that full moon does i really hate it i fucking oh my hate god it. It, I, I know i know those <laughs> shit movies i know I, I a movie can look as shitty as it is but god damn those the score it's all oh, the wait, same score like... it's the fucking horn I, oh, but like Puppet Master's iconic. And like, mm. they all go, oh no! <laughs> <laughs> what about Ginger Dead Man? Wait, actually, oh, well, this is a complete aside. I just want to point out for everybody listening. <laughs> uh, I was watching Ginger Dead Man 2 the other day. This mm-hmm. has nothing to do with anything. And it oh, it's very gay, right? Yeah. It's a, <laughs> well, very... a gay man gets raped with a curling iron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there is a gay, and he does get. Um, killed yeah. in a gay way but the um <laughs> the score and this is i know this because of my childhood rewatches is completely lifted from casper meets wendy oh my Wait, god i'm sorry really? the the uh the hillary, the hillary duff, duff one yeah i okay. <laughs> Wait, okay, 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 i'm sorry speaking of score lifts though so eric when you rewatch oh. this is the dracula score in this movie no it's incredibly similar and i i noticed the parts too it's when john franklin gets killed and it's when they're coming after the dinosaur with uh, in the tranquilizer bar. guns yeah, yeah. It, incredibly similar to dracula's score probably ripping off since i think dracula came out in like 90 or 92 or something. 92 so yeah this would have been two years later i i, I believe it was a heavy influence but it is not the same girl i, I, I double checked it's so close it's though it's so wild close. <laughs> I'm not saying they should look into suing. Maybe the time has passed, but no, they should not. Maybe because I mean, it was it's you know Francis Coppola's Dracula, but maybe because it's Dracula, it was already public domain. <laughs> no. It was not. Well, I'll go ahead and say it wasn't. No, uh, it was not. But sure, but we'll say it. We'll that's say not it. how that works. No, no. <laughs> if they had used like Swan Lake or something, they would have been fine. But, or music uh, from the '30s, Dracula. Yeah, uh, but mm, they, no, yeah, not even no. No, not even then. No, it's no. um, yeah, they're, no whatever um <laughs> it works in this movie it's really intense but it's it, it, it whatever <laughs> um yeah. reviews for this film i mean again at the time there were only seven reviews for this film for, uh, for the pg-13 cut um we're looking at a 43 percent on rotten tomatoes with an average score of 3.8 out of 10 however sure. the 2019 version has a 100 <laughs> <100%. laughs> percent it has a 100% on Rotten well Tomatoes. Well deserved. Yeah. There we go. With an average score of 6.6 6 out of 10. Uh, mm-hmm. Letterbox users have given this a 6.2 out of 10. That's fair. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think that's pretty fair. Um, I mean, this is going to be really stupid for a lot of people, but if you can get on side with the jokes, it is a very good time. Yeah. yeah. And I will say, and uh, not all of the jokes, for like when they just let the movie be funny naturally because a dinosaur is doing stuff it normally wouldn't or denise richards is being snarky it's good. but yeah. i think a couple actors i don't know a couple performances are trying very hard to be funny and aren't mm. well i will tell you this right now joe is messaging me last night he's like he really likes terry kaiser and the, and the helger character but you know who else he really likes in this movie <gasps> Siobhan Durkin. Oh, oh, oh well, we're gonna, Jesus if we're God. on talking about Siobhan Durkin, like, it's gonna be a whole thing. Uh, <laughs> well, we'll, we'll get to that, because yes, okay. she has some iconic fucking moments in this movie. She's amazing, and I wanna, yes, we should talk about Siobhan for sure. And everyone, if you don't know who Siobhan Durkin is, please go watch, or maybe don't watch, and just read about Leprechaun no, 2. No, please watch Leprechaun 2. It's <laughs> Eric's favorite Leprechaun. Oh, God, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Eric with the hot takes today, but um, no, it's my favorite. Maybe because of Siobhan Durkin. There we well, go. She's really also in Ghost in the Machine as a babysitter who gets killed by a washing machine. Oh, of course. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, Joe, let, let, talk, talk to us about this movie. What happens? Yes. Okay. Oh, God, it, it gets off with a bang because we open with a hard rock song that if you are watching with the captions, you get to hear we are talking about a dinosaur man. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> I was just like, wow, we're we're setting the tone right off the top here. The music in this movie is great, too. Like the actual songs. There is one. Well, that's the thing. There is, I think it's the song when Tam, Tammy is listening to some kind of country song. And I was like, Ooh, what that's is this? That's the one that gets me. <laughs> well, but Shazam, I, I tried to Shazam it. Shazam would not pick it up. No, these songs don't exist, I don't think. But they're all Shazam really said, good. Absolutely not. <laughs> uh but good music. Go on, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we've got this hard rock song, but it is accompanying the 
I wanted to say cheerleaders, but they're not in costume. It's just a bunch of girls doing choreography in a high school gymnasium. Does Step exist here? Is that what this is? Maybe? Or or may, maybe when cheerleaders rehearse or practice, they don't wear their actual... But that doesn't make any sense. I mean, no, that would make sense. Because I'm thinking back to Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the movie, which... Mm-hmm. Also, we covered on Patreon for no good reason other than I wanted to cover it. But yeah, I think in their sort of low-key rehearsals, they do just wear their their sort of street and or exercise clothes. So I certainly assume these girls were cheerleaders and not yeah. just... <laughs> it would make sense, but it never comes back up again. No, it doesn't. Which I'm <laughs> fine with. I don't need cheerleader and football player drama in this movie outside mm-hmm. of the opening fight scene. Sure. Yeah. So enter Michael, uh, Paul Walker, in his feature debut. He comes in and he is there to pick up Tammy, who is Denise Richards. Um, I'm sorry, his sweater crop top that he's wearing? Well, you said you didn't want to talk about football. <laughs> is that what they wear? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. man. I've been missing out on all these years of football then. It's like that. And then you've got the spandex onesie for wrestling. Mm-hmm. Like... High school is just very gay. And then they wonder why people are gay. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah. (sighs) Yeah. So he's there to pick up Tammy. And then they go outside the gym and they immediately run into her bestie, Byron Black, who is played by Theo Forsett. So, okay. Do do we want to dive into him now? Or do we want to wait until we maybe he has more of like a prominent role in the plot? I I will just say this. I mean, he is a sassy gay black man in this Mm -hmm. movie, but I do think he's one of the funniest parts of it. I enjoy him a lot and I enjoy his performance. Uh, And I feel like he he is immediately a part of this movie because even if he's not participating in a scene too much, his reaction shots are. He'll be like, oh. (laughs) Or when they grab each other's crotches. Good move. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) He always has a one-liner. And they're all good. Um, I guess another interesting thing to point out is the director in Mannequin 2, which Mm -hmm. you guys need to see, has a character that is um, essentially the exact same. It's like a black, flamboyant, gay... uh, uh, what else? And he wears similar clothes. It's interesting that it's a, just a stock type for this guy. Well, that's why I thought it was so funny that, you know, we we were looking at different reviews and one of them says that this is obviously a callback to RuPaul. And I thought, well, that oh. would mean that he was a drag queen. Like, that yeah. would be the obviousness. To me, this is baby Hollywood from Mannequin 2 on the move. It, yeah, exactly. Well, I guess, I mean, he's writing the script in a week, so he's pulling from his wealth of knowledge of his life, and mm-hmm. that 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 was the closest. So he remembered that character, but he didn't remember Terry Kaiser being in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> who's Who's got the bigger kind of nostalgia slash wow factor in the mannequin films? Like, everyone always remembers Hollywood. Yeah, but I mean, I just, Terry Kaiser's the catalyst for the, because he's the evil magician mm-hmm. who freezes <laughs> Christy Swanson. Oh my, oh it God, is wild. Christy you Swanson. would think that he would remember the villain in his own movie, but... Very um, strange. Yeah. <laughs> he's working a lot. He's got a lot of work to do. This was three years ago. Who knows? I guess. <laughs> well, he's saying that in an interview that was recorded for a oh, Blu-ray yeah. release 30 years later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you remember where you were 30 years ago? Um, preschool. (laughs) Oh, very helpful. Very specific. (laughs) All right. So, yes. um, So we've we've established the sort of central relationships. Almost immediately, we get this kind of tonal whiplash moment where Tammy just freaks the fuck out because she cannot accept Michael's yellow rose, which he eats. Which will come into play later. (laughs) Yeah. And she says she's not afraid of him. And we don't know who the him in question is. But give it a beat because... (laughs) We find out immediately. (laughs) Yeah. Billy, played by George Pilgrim, is rolling up with his crew. And then he wants to pick a fight. So, okay. I I love this fantasy world where it's like she is so afraid that this guy will murder Michael. And no one else seems to care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she was rightly afraid because they do murder Michael. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Who knew she was dating a teen sociopath? <laughs> Honestly, my only gripe with this movie, my only <gasps> big gripe, my big gripe is that, well, I, I don't know, I, it, it played better for me on a second viewing, but but Billy's death is not mm. the end game of this movie. He dies no. like, like a little past the halfway point, and it's it Tammy. Yeah. Well, Tammy doesn't even know. <laughs> 
He's set up. He's given a lot more setup than the evil scientist, whose plan I still mm, am don't quite on. understand. No, no their no. their motive is changing throughout. At one point, at the end, they're like, "This could be a pet, right? <laughs> it's immortality, or it could be a new line of pets." It's okay. crazy. I would accept though. Just Mad Frankenstein monster wants to put a man's brain in a T Rex. Like that, that isn't a yeah. motive enough. But they for keep me. saying other things out loud. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. and then are surprised that they put this brain in the dinosaur, and then the dinosaur does stuff. I. <laughs> <laughs> like i love it once again but it is um the logic is finicky well it makes you wonder if they had a different reaction to who michael was and they thought he was real dumb like oh well we'll put him in the dinosaur and then the dinosaur will just do what we want it won't have a personality wow that's not very nice of michael i, mean, <laughs> I, I will say too for, for for this dinosaur looking the way it does it has a surprising amount of personality in this movie mm-hmm, mm-hmm. oh it's I guess we're talking about really funny characters, but the dinosaur is the best. Like he's <laughs> he's so funny. The dinosaur is well used. In His hands movie. are the personality in the hands are what is what does it. Mm-hmm. I know it's not him, but I'm choosing to believe it's Paul it's Walker's Paul Walker. hands. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Otherwise, what was Paul Walker doing on this movie? Because he's maybe in it for five minutes. Then. It's crazy. He comes back at the end when he oh. uh, voice wise i the ending is i love the ending so much but (laughs) but we're still at this fight scene because i do need to highlight the fact that billy comes in and he immediately starts doing wrestling moves so he's basically doing a full wrestling elbow on Mm -hmm. michael we've got wendy who we mentioned earlier is played by siobhan durgan she is so fucking into this fight her reactions are everything She's a when we're talking about sincerity, like she, <laughs> she, she, she's selling this crazy into it character, like nobody's business. Well, it's, I guess because I, I don't really quite understand why she is so like, mm-hmm. like she already has Billy. It seems like she wants Billy. So what does she get from being so antagonistic towards Tammy and Michael? Well, she wants all of Billy, and Billy is still hung up on Tammy. Mm -hmm. That's why he's going after Michael. Like, if he didn't care about Tammy anymore, he'd leave Michael alone. So she's clearly not enough for him, and she's so she's passionate. She's a very well-written, well-rounded character. (laughs) She do be passionate. So many dimensions. (laughs) So many. As many dimensions as there are in one. (laughs) But, like, here's the thing. Durkin is giving everything. Like, whenever Wendy is on screen, you can't help but notice Wendy. No. Well, she's usually dancing or screaming. It's... Mm-hmm. it's <laughs> she, she, she do be scream a lot in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> this is true. Including in this scene. Yes. yes. <laughs> also, Denise Richards screams a lot, too, and it's always funny. It's always a little louder than you think it's going to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's a good scream queen. It's great. She cries a lot in this movie, She man. does. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's... Perfect. Yeah. I mean, the dinosaur also cries, so we should have yeah. that. The dinosaur cries what I believe is lube. Ew. <laughs> or saline solution or something. I, it's too viscous no, it's for saline thick. solution. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> they used to use lube in movies all the time, right? Or oh, KY sure. jelly or whatever. Yeah, that that sounds right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you would know. <laughs> yeah, you're the filmmaker. I, I believe uh, the, the, the thing in the thing is covered in loop and full moon that's a full moon technique like like their uh terror vision and all of those would be covered in (laughs) goop sure yeah sure sure. (laughs) we'll say yes (laughs) say yes to lube folks always that helps okay so this fight comes to an end when officers i am not going to be able to keep them apart so i'm just going to say both of their names all the time we've got norville who is played by george flower and also neville who is played by ken carpenter i can't tell you which one is which they discover that the boys are engaged in a testicular standoff because they are grabbing each other by the gonads um i love how the looks like we got us one of them testicular standoffs <laughs> this happens all the time in happens this town? all the time uh in los angeles are they wait is this set in los angeles where's the set i want to say los angeles because it looks like los angeles it really does nothing to hide it i've been in thousand oaks the last week on like in art department on this reality show and it look it, it's, it's actually throwing me through a loop watching this movie again because it looks oh my god is denise richardson said reality show 
Uh, no, she is not. <laughs> um, I will say, though, so Buck Flower, who plays Norville, he is apparently very famous for playing, like, homeless and transient type uh-huh. characters. Do you so... recognize him from Wishmaster? Oh, yes. Yes, he's in, in The Wh- Fog. And... The Fog, Escape from New York. Like, he, uh, he's a star man. A lot of John Carpenter movies, actually. Yes, I th- they must have been friends. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, Sorority Babes and the Slimeball Bolorama. He's Great the janitor. <laughs> he's, oh, he's in Pumpkinhead, too. I mean, the weirdest thing about this movie is that it has a huge number of actors who worked in other low-budget horror films. I don't know if it's just, oh, yeah, it's Los Angeles and everybody has done it, and therefore it's like a six degrees of well, low-budget filmmaking. I, you, no, I think you're right, Joe. I think you're right. Like this is, cause, I mean, the thing I is, that too. All, the, all the ties and relationships Raffle probably made in, like, what, the 15, 20 years he'd been in the business up until this point? Like, mm-hmm. I can guarantee, yeah, these are all, he's calling in a lot of favors right now. Yeah, <laughs> sure. The, um, uh, Sheriff Black is in Mac and Me. Okay. Uh, he's the judge at the very end. And... God, there's somebody, I guess Terry Kaiser. So I don't know. Right. He's met a lot of people. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just agree. <There> go. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael wins this because he is wearing a cup because he came from football practice. That the other guy could not feel when I he grabbed. so. And and that's what comes out, too, of George Pilgrim's interview, too, because he's like, you know, they they want us to wear cups. So Paul and I are fighting and we're like, this doesn't. It's too obvious that we're wearing cups, but I'm like, yeah, but Paul Walker is supposed to be wearing a cup, so it makes Mm -hmm. sense for him to wear one. But (laughs) they decided as actors to not wear cups during this scene and just go for each other. Oh, I love it. I love the method dick grabbing. (laughs) (laughs) It's because they're all all gay. They're all secretly gay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So... When Billy does not win this and he is embarrassed, he does insist that he will kill Michael. <laughs> and the cops do nothing. They're the right cops there. do nothing. Yeah. Uh, um, Tammy should be happy or or feel some kind of elation. And instead, she's just like, <laughs> and she runs off. Enter Byron. Don't give up. True love never fails, honey. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love He's always him. there for support. <laughs> So then we get some very, very dramatic orchestral music, and we're introduced to the titular T-Rex. We've got smoke, this thing is animatronic, and then we're introduced to our villain. So we have a henchman named Carl, who is played by John Edmondson. We have Helga, who is played by Ellen Dubin. And then we have Dr. Wachenstein, who is played by Terry Kaiser. (laughs) Don't you know the world's famous Dr. Wachenstein? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, Vashenstein. I, just, I this is say, a character. <laughs> These are characters. I do love that that the, the, the cutaway shot we get to this T-Rex with the fog run. I think oh, it it's looks beautiful. really, really cool. Mm-hmm. It's very atmospheric. You're like, oh, okay. This is not directed by somebody who doesn't know what the fuck they're doing. It's like, I feel like if you just gave this guy a bit more money and a little more time, he could probably give you a really good horror film. I agree with that. So also in this I don't even know where we are. It's some kind of warehouse. A sound stage. <laughs> sound stage. <laughs> we do have a computer electronics controller, Bobby, who is, yes, played by Children of the Corns, John Franklin. And he's very excited about the technological capabilities of what he can do. He really wants to show this off. So we get this demo of what the animatronic dino can do. And... Then we learn the plan is to give this thing a brain and make it immortal. <laughs> so stupid. I just, he's, like, he's like, arms! And like the arms just kind of like wiggle in their T-Rex way. And he's like, mm-hmm. it's mouth! And like the mouth just kind of moves a little. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's so impressive. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, Bo- Bobby is very impressed by this. Oh, sure. Yeah. Bobby wants to fuck this T-Rex. Oh, well, my God. It, it, he does give it some head. This is true. It's gross. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that night, Tammy invites Michael over, and he's very excited, so much so he packs his condom, and unfortunately, he is spotted going into her house on the second floor by Wendy, and who I, originally I was like, blonde bitch and Michelle. brunette bitch, oh, but yeah. yes, it's Michelle, played by Michelle Maka. Um, I will say, though, 
So not only does he grab his condom, he kisses the condom oh, yeah. <laughs> before he takes it. And this entire bit is obviously cut out of the PG-13 cut. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's better to suggest that he would never have sex or he would have unprotected sex. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, so the girls are going to call Billy, and then we go inside to Tammy's bedroom. They're making out. He says, I love you. Yeah, he does. They have never had sex. They are apparently not really dating. Uh, okay. He says, I love Wait, you. Wait, but they're teenagers, or they're supposed to be teenagers. It's <laughs> like, well, you know. I guess that's the thing, though, right? We don't know their relationship before this movie, so I, mm-hmm. I was kind of under the impression that they had been courting, let's say, for at least maybe not a significant amount of time, but enough time for him to say, I love you (laughs) before they're going to fuck. My God, no, you fuck. And then you say, I love you. And then that way you can write it off as, oh, it was just an endorphin thing. I didn't actually mean it. Joe, you need therapy. (laughs) (laughs) Who hurt you? Uh, So many people. Um, But uh, yeah. I also, I'm sorry, this is going to be another quote episode for me, but like, I I love whenever he crawls in and her dad calls up to her room because that's something they can do because she lives above the garage. And she's mm-hmm. like, I knocked my dictionary over. I'm doing homework. <laughs> Wait, her excuses throughout the movie are so fucking funny. The fucking, when, so the dinosaur like punches through her bedroom, takes mm-hmm. her out later. And when she comes back and she's pretending everything's fine, and they're like, what happened? And she says, I don't know. It was a meteor or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wait to go Very look for it. Very believable, Tammy. It's Very so believable. Fucking, she's so good. <laughs> a meteor. <laughs> she needs to work on her lying, but yeah, she is a teenage girl. <laughs> okay, so unfortunately, Billy and his gang gang arrive, and they just push hi these parents as though they're allowed <laughs> to come so into this house wild. and beat the shit out of someone. <laughs> I mean, nobody's going to stop him, so... The parents Clearly. do nothing. Yeah. Absolutely. Nothing. The, the, and the dad acts all angry. He's like, it's Billy again. He's like, oh, well, walk, walk right up, son. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I am curious as to how long Tammy and Billy dated. Right. Like, It was one week. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to know. He probably said I love you during sex, and that's why he is the way he is now. Oh. Right. That explains oh. everything. <laughs> so Michael ends up having to escape on foot. Don't know why he doesn't try to get into his truck, which he parked in the next house over, but it's fine. Sure. So he is pursued down the street. He is beaten in a very unconvincing stunt. He is locked in the back of Billy's truck, and then he is left at a local wildlife preserve where he is promptly mauled by a lion. First of all, so th- this bat is rubber. It looks like a rubber bat. It's hilarious because it-, it comes nowhere near him. But th- okay. You were glossing over this. He dr- He's like, I'm going to let you go. Takes him to a wildlife preserve and <laughs> in the hopes that a lion will maul him, which it does. Mm-hmm. Um, which I it also- does immediately. <laughs> well, I also love that he tries to climb a tree and there's a jaguar up there or something. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's basically Paul Walker versus the big cats. It's just such a random thing to have. It's such a, it's such a roundabout way to go about murdering someone. It's almost like if you don't want to get your hands dirty, right? You're like, well, I'll leave the big cats to do it. It's also wild how intact his body is after this. Oh, He's fine. For sure. He's <laughs> fine. There's like no blood on him. They should have torn him apart. It's um, crazy. Well, the mauling itself looks very realistic. So, it's I mean, horrifying. R- Raffles animal training came into play here. But yeah, it looks like he has had his throat torn out. Yeah, which is wild because we know he was on the set of that Tippi Hedren movie. Yeah. So we know he knows what a real <laughs> animal attack looks like. This is actually just footage repurposed from Roar. Oh, yeah. And I said <laughs> his dead body. He's not... Dead. He's not dead. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, no. I fully had in my notes and is killed. And then it's like, oh, he's not dead. Oh, no, he's, he's not, not dead. <laughs> okay. But this leads to one of my favorite di- line deliveries when when Tammy and Byron go to the hospital. And they're like, I'm looking for Michael. And the nurse just goes, oh, he's an ICU. <laughs> mm-hmm. She was great. <laughs> she wanted she wanted to be a member of the union and she only had this one line. So she had to fucking sell it, man. I'm big, I don't, that's not good bedside manner. Miss nurse lady. No, it is it's not. true. Who are these kids? Why are you letting everyone into the ICU? Everyone can go in this guy's room. <laughs> so I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Tammy is wearing an absolutely horrendous 1994 outfit. She's got a brown suede fringe jacket with a blossom hat. 
It is so fucking Her weird. outfits are crazy. <laughs> her funeral outfit is the craziest oh thing God. I've ever seen in my life. No, the funeral outfit is, I love the funeral oh, outfit. It's amazing. It's gorgeous, but why are you wearing it to a yes. funeral? Oh, yeah. Well, no, but, so, I have the answer for you because he's not, she's dead. not dead. So yeah. it's not a funeral for her. Sure. <laughs> and then after this, they're going to medieval times so that she can have a giant leg of chicken. I'm telling you, though, I, 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 I forgot she was wearing that outfit at the funeral. And as soon as it cuts that, I was like, fuck, that looks good. <laughs> oh, she looks amazing. <laughs> I mean, it, it's very much giving Renaissance chic. Well, it's almost like she's a maiden and yeah. this is her steed, except it's a fucking dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. You, she's definitely wearing that at the funeral so she can wear it for the rest of the movie. Yes. The... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so Billy comes in, Tammy's having none of it, so she kicks him in the balls. And mm -hmm. Byron threatens to scratch out the eyes of his number two, Weasel, who is played by the people under the stairs, Sean Whalen. Um, love. It's a, uh, this is one of my favorite. It, it's, it's so it's not even like a joke or anything. But yeah, when, whenever Byron goes, I'll scratch out your fucking eyes. But then like, <laughs> Tammy just goes, and hey, we mean it. And she like pulls her hands up in a claw form. <laughs> she's it's so, so she's so committed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I also want to point out in the commentary when they're talking about Sean Whalen from People Under the Stairs and they're like, oh, what is he from? Oh, he's the milk ads guy. Yes. Like the got what? milk guy. And I'm just, he's in Twister. So, you know? no, so here, here's the thing. So appar apparently, I don't know if it was right before People Under the Stairs or right before, or between that and this, he was very famous for being in the very first got milk commercial. Oh, yes. Directed wow. by Michael okay. Bay. Yes. Think, directed yeah. by Michael Whoa. Bay. And, okay. and so that, that commercial got him a lot of gigs including this one for tammy and the t-rex so that's why the director would be like hey that's the guy milk guy yes sure uh, okay. but uh, he's had such a he's had a solid career i i he, and <laughs> he's also an actor i mean like obviously he's not like an a-list actor but like he's really good he does the convention circuit he's a mm -hmm. really 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 nice dude i love it because when he shows up he's so instantly visually recognizable and you're just mm -hmm. like oh that dude classic character actor it's for me he's always merkin ain't working he's jerkin from never been kissed oh <laughs> uh, yes <laughs> okay so dr wachenstein and helga <laughs> she is wearing purple dominatrix gear that's what i wrote and in my notes helga is the best of the villains correct do we all agree on that yeah. oh 100 that... okay i would have taken her sure. as the lead villain i oh well that would have been way better not that tyler kaiser isn't great at what he does or whatever but helga as a mad scientist mm -hmm. oh my god and she gets away like zingers like I, I, all of her lines are zingers so like literally she talks to this, this receptionist nurse at the desk and she's like stupid nails <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and then what the nurse does like a say. claw thing too, right? <laughs> Wild. Yeah. So they go in here and just immediately clock the fact that Michael has no family. I mean, he has this surrogate Uncle Buck. Who nobody no, Bob, <laughs> ever fills in on what's happening. They just let him grieve. Yeah. Well, I, I think though he has an arc. Cause just, oh, maybe he doesn't, but does he pledge mm -hmm. to not drink anymore at this funeral? No, at the funeral, he's just a mess in like. He admits he's a drunk. Yeah. Okay. Well, progress. That's a progress. But like Denise Richards, like the focus is on her pretending to be sad is the joke mm -hmm. of that scene while this man is expressing <laughs> like very weeping. real grief. It's crazy. <laughs> but, okay. But, 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 oh, but, and then the dinosaur cries in that scene too. Yeah, goes, that's the that dinosaur like, crying yeah. scene. But but th this this CPR that they try to give right. Michael's body. And, but, hey, because oh, You can't just punch a chest until someone's alive. Well, and Helga's using the excuse to make out with this comatose corpse. But... I, I, the the, the <laughs> I abruptness from which we go to live, live. Well, it's, he's gone. I've done all I could. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Helga pops a piece of gum in her mouth. <laughs> God, I love her. I love her so much. Just so good. And of course, on upon hearing this news, Tammy and Byron both faint, which faint. allows <laughs> an opportunity for the villains to take the body and get away. Um, the, also, the physical comedy with which Helga wheels this gurney out of the hospital, because she runs into mm -hmm. the wall. <laughs> Multiple times, yeah. Her physicality throughout is great, especially mm -hmm. her bit at the end, which we will get to when we get to, I suppose. But mm -hmm. her skirt is so stupid. It's so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, know who she was giving me? What? Who? A similar character in purple from another campy film that we love, Trace, Texas mm. Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation. <gasps> oh my god, Darla? Oh, Darla's the best part of that movie. 
like a Darla and Helga spinoff where they just go on a Thelma and Louise road trip. I would shit myself. <laughs> also, speaking about movies that A-list stars have like, w- like refused to talk about a lot. Mm-hmm. It's so oh, sad because yeah. that's both of their best movie. I'll- yeah! <laughs> Eric. <laughs> It's really good. It's my second favorite Texas Chainsaw movie behind the original. It's really good. It's my third after the original and the remake. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. Uh, so a, a very, very amusing act of physical comedy is when Michael starts to wake up as they load him into the car and Helga just punches him unconscious. <laughs> she punches oh. him unconscious like four times in this movie. It's so good. <laughs> so good. I wonder if she was written to be bulkier. Because she's well, kind of the muscle, even though they have like a muscle guy. Then, well, honestly, and not to like, not to like generalize the name Helga, mm-hmm. but it does sound like a more butch woman, right? It does. Oh, sure. But then mm-hmm. she probably acted her ass off in that audition and snatched well, that part. Or they ran out of time and they needed to cast somebody. <laughs> and they just magically cast the most perfect person. Yeah, exactly. I really and like refused to change the character name. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> like Don't do the so. accent. Just talk like an American. We're just going to call you Helga. Well, Doreen doesn't really have the same ring to it. No. This is true. Yeah. Okay. So we move Michael into this warehouse <laughs> stage <laughs> and this is when dr Wachenstein messily removes this brain and i so gross. i think we haven't really talked about the gore because this is the first sort of really good instance mm-hmm. the gore in this movie looks absolutely amazing it's really good <laughs> well okay so i was as, I, I don't know exactly what they use for the gore but because raffle said he grew up on a farm so he was used to being around slaughterhouses and stuff so mm-hmm. I don't know if he actually got animal parts to be in this movie or if he the just The brain knows. looks really real, doesn't it? Yeah, very, very much so. Yeah. But, yeah, but yeah, this, again, this scene where they're cutting out his brain is heavily edited in this PG-13 cut. Well, the, the oh, PG-13 version is scary because it just kind of shows John Franklin covered in blood, but you mm-hmm. don't see why. Yeah. <laughs> and you just assume they, like, tore him Killed apart someone. or something. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and and, and that, that's, the again, the biggest issue with that PG-13 cut is that it's so, the continuity is fucked in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> so my favorite bit of incontinuity in this moment is where we see his penis <laughs> i mean no if oh, i had okay. seen that i would have thought it was great but we see him chop off the top of michael's head but oh. then he just removes the whole top of the head mm-hmm. even though he would have had to lift the head up and continue sawing. <laughs> well this i think is movie magic right because i feel like the the way that this is shot it's like a depth perception thing where it's paul walker's actual head like in the background but then we have this like skull head in the foreground to make it look like he's pulling it off of his head but really it's like you know two feet in front of it hmm i don't know but we kind of see his penis. I mean, it's kind of Yeah, well, I mean, like, sheet. it's like a, a prop thing. They made it sure. big, though. That's fun. They did make it. <laughs> they, they made it pretty big. <laughs> they make it do a dance. Oh, which too. is a, not a plot point later, but it comes up. Oh, my God. Eat your heart out, Euphoria. Oh, my God. <laughs> we were doing it first in 94. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we move this brain over. Bobby starts to set it up, and then Dr. Vagenstein connects all of these electrodes, and he tests it. And we see the T-Rex first lift Helga's skirt, and then uh, it kicks Carl in the body. <laughs> the, the the science checks out here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is how you do it. <laughs> it's just that simple, folks. <laughs> just connect the brain with a couple wires. <laughs> sure. <laughs> the fact that the brain at no point dies, even though it's like completely exposed to air. <laughs> I don't understand brain science at this well, point in my life, honestly. There's no brain stem on the brain anyway. They they had to dismember it. Well, actually, I'm sorry. They just pulled the brain out as if there's yes. not a stem connected to this brain. Yep. But yeah, the green liquid that they put it in seems to um, hydrate it enough. Sure. <laughs> Why not? I feel like Dr. Herbert West would have issues with the science in this film. Mm, would he? <laughs> he would say you're doing it wrong and let me show you how to do it better inject some green liquid into this body <laughs> he would be so much meaner than that but yeah well and true. also th- that's like a neon green liquid this is like mm-hmm. a saint patrick's day li- the green liquid like right. leprechaun too yep 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 siobhan durkin said siobhan brought the green move aside. <laughs> <laughs> wendy's not in the scene i've got green uh, liquid can be. i be in it now <laughs> 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 the scene would be better if Siobhan was there. If Wendy's there. Yeah, yeah. Oh my Ooh, god. 
Helga and Wendy spinoff. Oh my god! Ooh, Amazing. Oh yeah, that's good. Because <laughs> Wendy's still alive, as far as yeah, we know. In this she's movie. not. Yeah. She, she, she's the one-legged girl that's over there. <laughs> <laughs> I connect the brain to her missing leg, and all of a sudden she can walk again. Just give her a T Rex leg. Oh, oh my I God. love that. Oh well, now I want like I actually want it. <laughs> I want it really bad. Okay, so this has been a long day, right? And Bobby hasn't eaten, so he's very hungry. We do get a Sons of Sicily pizza delivery boy played by Efren Ramirez, who shows up, and the T-Rex is, of course, learning how to operate itself, so it scares him off. Okay, wait, but again, the cutting here. So it's like, John Franklin's like, oh, my, my stomach's rumbling, and we haven't eaten all day, remember? And, and, and Vodka's- Pizza delivery shows up. Well, he's, he's like, <laughs> order a pizza. And then, yeah, smash cut to the pizza boy showing up. <laughs> mm-hmm. We do also get dinosaur POV in these shots, so... That is my one issue with the filmmaking of this movie, I will say. There is nothing to differentiate the dinosaur POV from the other camera shots. Mm, Like, I just think there's, like, a weird... Qu- same thing at the more. very end of the movie they're like just like a little like a like like little squares on the corner or some other lens it just looks like every other shot in the movie and i forget mm-hmm. it isn't coverage sometimes right until there's a weird zoom <laughs> <laughs> not to get filmy do it <laughs> I do appreciate that Carl uses Michael's empty head cavity as a place to put his pizza slice. So gross. Even the other guy says it's gross too, right? Yeah, he does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he Thank definitely God. comments on that. Because, like, disgusting. That's worse than any coroner eating on a body. Like, ugh, I hate it. Yeah, it's giving big coroner energy, right? Like, I'm cutting up this body and eating a piece of pizza. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because coroners normally eat sandwiches when they're doing autopsies. That's yes, what we've learned. This in the is past. true. Yes, <laughs> always. Famously, historically. <laughs> okay, so Bobby is then left alone with this T Rex and he makes fun of it. And this is when he is decapitated. But th- okay, this looks good though because like the, you can see like the meat stretch in his neck wound. Like, oh, it's, yeah, mm-hmm. it's gross. And, and the body keeps running, which I really yep. appreciate. <laughs> I love it. It's funny and appropriate and kind of gross at the same time. Yeah. And I mean, I, I'm going to assume, I, I'm, I'm assuming perhaps incorrectly that uh, Theo Forsett, who plays Byron Black, is a gay man. But if he's not, then we have lost our one gay actor in this movie, in this scene. Wah, wah. Wah, wah. <laughs> well. <laughs> I win them all in 94. But this is also when we start to get the, the the brilliance of the physical comedy with the dinosaur as it uses a hand mirror to look at its own reflection. Oh, it's really <laughs> cute too. Like that should I don't know if people use that as a gif or whatever, but they should. Oh, it be. should they should. They should. Oh my any, goodness. Any single time that this T-Rex uses its arms and it's so obviously <laughs> somebody's hands in a pocket. Yeah. <laughs> 2 minutes later on the telephone. So fucking good. <laughs> Uh, I love too that this movie has enough sense to give even the wackiest supporting characters something to do. So the T Rex ends up kicking Carl, and he right. is obviously flattened by this door. Uh, or sorry, he steps on him on his yeah. way out, and he flattens him. But then there's this woman who's just she's got this whole thing about her lottery <laughs> ticket numbers as she's talking on the payphone. You didn't need to give her all of that, and yet you oh, did. Oh, I'm happy about it. The world feels very rich in this film. Oh no, I, I wrote down this. <laughs> She, there's a dinosaur here harry it just squashed a man don't forget 25 and 7 to win <laughs> and then she runs away <laughs> oh man i hope they won i hope that honestly that should have been like a mid credit oh my god or like an end credit scene I, it wasn't popular back then but like you sat through the whole end credits you get this at the very end but but this and and this is gift though this is when we get to watch this t-rex use this payphone which Mm -hmm. and i get it people i I, some people were like oh that's that's very much like audrey too using the payphone in little shop of horrors and i'm like yeah but this t-rex can't speak and it has these little (laughs) arms It is very funny because it sounds like a dirty phone call, like a prank phone yes. call. Yes, yeah. it's like Billy, and, but it's like Black Christmas. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> uh, it is so funny how scary this movie is for the characters, uh, and just uh, not for us. <laughs> She's like, "Who is this?" <laughs> <laughs> I also love that she she ends up either hanging up or he ends up hanging up, but then he tries to make another call and he doesn't have any more quarters. And oh, I just yeah. thought, where did you get the first quarter? I think I think 
Did the lady drop it? Well, maybe when she hung up, some change came out. Is that how payphones work? I don't really know. Sure. If oh. you overfed the machine, sometimes it would give you change. Some. Well, this is a really nice payphone. There we go. <laughs> a generous You know payphone. what? It probably has somebody else's brain attached to it, like the camcorder at the Ew. end. Ew. Oh, my God. Brave little toaster, but like with this style of movie. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> Brave Little Toaster is, like, way scarier than it this. It fucking is. I've had plenty of nightmares about that air, air conditioner dying. Who's that? Yeah, that, that scene's so fucked up. Ugh. Oh, sure. Go back and listen to that Patreon episode. Yep. I love that you just said, yep. You didn't even. No, because I know we talked about it before. You always get, we always get on when I repeat the same stories. I know we talked about that goddamn air conditioner before. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we cut to a party featuring possibly the worst dancing I have ever seen on screen. Well, not from Wendy. <laughs> I mean, you're, I'm Wendy just making sure you're not all. talking about. Okay, as long as we're not talking about Wendy right now, we're saying the worst dancing. Well, so, so Joe, so what you're saying is this is not like a, a, a raw level of, of directing in, no. in a dance scene. <laughs> It's very evident that the direction they were given was everyone dance. I'm not telling you what the music is. Just give it everything. <laughs> I wonder whose house this was, too. Oh, yeah. Like what in context of the movie? Like what character's house? No. like I, I, oh. Was this like Raffles neighbor's house? Probably. <laughs> it's within 20 miles. I'm sorry, but you're right, though. Which character's house is this, and why do they have tents set up in the backyard as if they're having, like, a formal event for this high school party? Yeah, because it couldn't be mm. Billy's house or anybody like that, because no. Denise Richards wouldn't have come, but it's someone in the same social circle. So, uh -huh. Who knows? Hmm. I couldn't help but wonder if it was, like, maybe Michelle's, because she is there, and she apologizes to yeah. Tammy, like... Michelle's character is strange. It feels like there should be some payoff with her, right? Well, mm -hmm. does she die, or does she just leave no. the movie? Uh, she just leaves, and okay. then she's never... <laughs> like, she leaves <laughs> after this. She apologizes to Tammy, and right. then she walks away, and she is never seen again. No, well, maybe the apology was her arc that, yeah, that was spared her, her from the dinosaurs wrath yeah we don't, yeah. We don't need her anymore no. we'll move on yeah. no but honestly I, I, she probably should have been killed in this whole oh sure. yeah every yeah so question for you boys oh. what the fuck is a kamikaze and vodka chaser oh well uh, so uh, the vodka chaser it's just a shot of vodka that you're chasing the kamikaze with the kamikaze mm -hmm. is a shot um i believe oh god correct me if i'm wrong eric but i think it's Red Bull with I want to say Jaeger. No, that's a Jaeger bomb. Um, who? Um, oh, I got it. Oh, it's vodka. It's I was vodka. Wrong. Yeah, <laughs> vodka triple second lime juice is a kamikaze. Oh, so why would you do a vodka chase? Well, that's the joke. He's giving her. Mo <laughs> he's he's having her chase liquor with he's trying more to get liquor. her. Ugh. wasted. Byron, why would you do this to get her wasted? That's that's yeah. the joke. <laughs> I don't think that's a good friendship. Man. Uh, what? Are you kidding me? Joe. It's giving it's giving Terrifier 2 vibes. That's <gasps> all. Get, oh, no. She's no. grief stricken. You're basically roofing her with vodka. Uh, he's not giving her an actual roofie. He's giving her more booze. And he's telling her what's in it, and she, which she willingly accepts. Sure. He doesn't sneak Molly into her drink a la Terrifier <laughs> so 2. so wild. That does cheer that girl up, though. So. It really... Th yeah. That... Right? <laughs> look, as I said in that episode... Not to talk about Terrifier 2. No, look, I get, don't drug your friends without telling them, but I'm telling mm -hmm. you, if you want to give me Molly without telling me, go ahead. <laughs> Trace will always accept your drugs. I will always accept free drugs. <laughs> okay, so what Tammy is not accepting is anything to do with Billy. She tells him she never wants to see him again, so this leaves the door open for Wendy, who makes her big move and they leave together awesome. okay but i do love that <laughs> tammy's line is i don't want to see you for the rest of my life ever <laughs> <laughs> it needed to be said oh uh... and then some there's a psychic at this party because then when, when when you know we get the jurassic park like water shaking <laughs> this girl's like maybe it's a dinosaur <laughs> <laughs> oh no i like that line. i do too <laughs> I'm more fond of the rom-com that we never get to see with caveman bartender Ken, who is played by John Conway, and redheaded party girl, who is played by fucking Poppy Montgomery of that goddamn CBS show. Dude, Poppy Montgomery. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> what? 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 But they don't die, right? They both live. No, I, yeah. Or Poppy lives, I believe. They both live. They're hiding under this makeshift bartending table. Mm. And then we just never see them again afterwards. Bartending table. You mean a bar? Yeah, bartending <laughs> table. That's what I said. I'm sticking to it. 
Look, I've had one too many kamikaze and vodka chasers. Oh my god! Oh, Honestly, boy. next time I see you, we're gonna do a, uh, you know, that's no. we're, gonna, we're gonna do a kamikaze and we're gonna do a vodka chaser. That's gonna be it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be fun. Sure, sure. And then we'll go to the shooting range. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we do get to watch Michael, who is just lurking on the periphery of this party giant fucking t-rex animatronic standing at the edge of the party watching as wendy and billy head off to his car and then this is when weasel pisses on him so he rips out his guts the wide shots in this movie are crazy because they always make it clear just how silly what's happening is like Mm -hmm. sean whalen walks right up to this dinosaur and and he's like in plain sight it's Mm -hmm. wild Oh, but he's right on it. We, we we did miss it, but it's it's whenever the the T Rex is chasing Carl, and we get a long shot of it in this warehouse soundstage thing. Oh yeah, but it's clearly like the the, the T Rex is like oh the walking shot. Yeah, uh-huh. it's like green screened <laughs> over the actual shot of the movie. It looks so yes. bad. It looks <gasps> so, so bad. funny. So it looks great. better in the PG thirteen VHS cut, or if it's all uh, is it because it's grainy? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, you can't see anything. <laughs> and I think everybody watched this on VHS for twenty sure. years. So everybody. Body, as if everyone watched this movie. Yeah, oh, the people who did watch it. The four All people. five of you who watched it, yes. <laughs> okay, so Michael approaches Billy and Wendy, who are having enthusiastic sex in the back of a Corvette, or convertible, we'll see. Uh, and she, of course, only notices Michael when it's standing right in front of her, <laughs> and she starts screaming, and this confuses Billy, who just keeps going, I'm good, right? I'm good. <laughs> this okay. Th- this is a gag. This is not the first time I've seen this type of gag in a movie. And I, I, th- there's another no, one that's a, a lot. Well, this, I feel like there's another more famous scene in a horror type movie. But this is Siobhan Durkin acting her ass off. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh yeah, she screams. Oh, God bless well, her. also the, the shot of it though, when it picks her up, like the shot of her dangling from its mouth by her leg is it's honestly kind. Of, yeah, it looks really good. I'm surprised they weren't more afraid of damaging the T-Rex. Yeah. Whenever it picks someone up, they are not, like, holding back, wiggling around mm-hmm. and punching it. And, like, they're borrowing this dinosaur for a week to yeah. film yeah. this. <laughs> and then it has to go to wherever. I don't get it. This actually looks like one of the most convincing times when the dinosaur picks someone up because we get two decapitations and then he'll also pick up Byron in a minute. But this is the part where I was like, oh, you know what? I actually most believe this action. Yeah. I, I, and maybe it's because it, it's an actual actor like moving in its mouth as opposed right. to like yeah, a dummy She really head. sells the fuck out of it. She does. Yeah, she, she does. is thrashing herself. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, so the dinosaur has now been noticed, and it does <laughs> instigate a stampede among these party people. Oh, uh, you wanted someone to get, like, a, a high heel in their eye, didn't you? Uh, n- no, it was just more kind of unexpected. I didn't anticipate there would be a party sequence with a lot of extras in this movie. I kind of thought we were going to keep it relatively contained. Yeah, this feels very um, Nightmare on Elm Street 2. Uh. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So um, this is also when Billy gets it. Yes. So, uh, Joe, do you agree with me on this? Like, I mean, I, I oh, a hundred percent. Like, I, yeah. I, honestly, I don't even need his death to be at the end of the movie, but I need Tammy to see this happen. Oh, that would have been nice. Well, because, because Tam, by the end of this movie, Tammy does not even know that Billy is dead. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. And no. it, yeah, like it should be a double funeral with Michael and Billy side by side. And she's pretending to cry. Well, yes. Oh they only give those two a funeral and everybody else at the party. And they're right next to each other. So we're going to put the guy that murdered Michael <laughs> by a barium <laughs> right next to him. <laughs> For all of eternity. Yes. yes. <laughs> I hope Billy was buried with Wendy. They seemed happy. to. Well, go. Wendy's alive. Oh, shit. That's right. She just has one leg. Yeah. She's right. that one legged <laughs> yeah, girl. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Yeah. Still dancing. So Billy, so Billy is dead. Byron ends up getting knocked down as people stampede, and he thinks he's going to die, but the dinosaur just picks him up and kind of sets him off on his way. And, and brushes Wendy his is shoulder. actually the one who runs away with Byron. Yeah, well, okay, but like, okay, as you said, the arms do a lot of funny things in this movie, but the arms, mm-hmm. bru- like, dusting off his shoulders <laughs> yes. is hilarious. Kind, yeah, it, it is one of my, my biggest laughs in this it's movie. It's really cute. He sells, like, just the bafflement of yeah. that moment. Like, he, good, good actors all around. This actor didn't really go on to do anything. No, he has like three other credits. And it's a shame <laughs> because he's really I, good. I think he's really good in this. He is mm-hmm. really good in this. 
Hmm. Yeah. So um so Byron ends up running off with Wendy and this is when Michael ends up crushing two guys in a car. He's killed a couple of other people at this party. This is a bit of a weird thing where I wasn't sure if these were meant to be members of Billy's crew. They're all the ga- they're all the crew people. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't clear enough to me. Yeah. And for a moment I thought, oh, Michael is just randomly <laughs> killing people. Is he a villain now? No. That could have been a place to take the movie, um, but thankfully. It's just, no. So it's like Hollow Man, like he just goes insane and just starts killing people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what? I'm in a dinosaur's body now. I'm just going to do whatever the fuck I yeah. want. You just have one of the scientists, one throwaway line where it's like, oh, he thinks he's a dinosaur now. <laughs> and then you've got it. You're good. Except yeah, apparently yeah. trike darks and bullets will now work on this animatronic dinosaur just because he has a brain inside of it. Ridiculous. It's like Chucky, right? Yes! Where all of a sudden oh, he becoming starts more to become human. more. <laughs> <laughs> he's becoming flesh. <laughs> I mean, he is going to cry in a couple of scenes. That's true. He does. Okay, so Neville and Norville arrive. They brought popcorn that they can eat at this crime scene, and they are poking at bodies <laughs> with sticks. So, okay, th- let's talk about Byron here, because this is, I feel like, the, the moment where we really get, like, the biggest showcase for Byron, the relationship with his father. Mm-hmm. We right. get a really bad drop-the-soap joke, but again... Oh, mm-hmm. that's right. Or just, like, don't drop anything around, around his kid or whatever, which, again, yeah. like, apparently people booed these lines in film screenings, but again, I, 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 I think that's missing... The the point of these characters and how the movie is handling them yeah you're not supposed to like the guy saying it and you're supposed to like the guy they're saying it too it's, yeah uh, yeah come on see audiences i could get behind that a little bit more except that these characters also don't get any kind of comeuppance yeah that's that tri- would have been fun i don't know the context for them getting a comeuppance would be weird though because michael killing mm-hmm. them would be crazy and the scientists aren't trying to kill anybody either well right. i mean look, i mean i know there's not the movie we have but it could be like michael is like walking by and witnesses he the, falls over <laughs> well like he, he witnesses them he, like do, do a gay joke at byron's expense and he like we get like a close-up of the t-rex like, eye doing like a side eye and then he just like whacks them and like slashes their heads off or something <laughs> Mm-hmm. I would have loved that. That well, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I I can just picture how it's shot, you know. <laughs> no. But no, I mean, again, like, I mean, does Byron feel like a progressive role in this film to either one of you? I don't know if he was intended to be one, but I like him and the portrayal and how the movie generally treats him. I, I'm I'm pretty fine with it. I don't know if I. No, I, I'd even, like, I was gonna say, I don't know if I love it, but I, I lean well, positive. I mean, I, like, the, does he go beyond, uh, Joe, this is for you, actually. So does he mm-hmm. go beyond just the gay best friend who only exists to support our female protagonist? Yeah, so for me, he doesn't, really. And I think in the context of this film, that's not a huge issue. Like, this isn't Byron's movie. No. He is firmly kind of a supporting character to me. So I think he's well used. He actually gets a lot more to do. Than That's I what I was going to yeah. say. Like, his function is definitely gay best friend, but he's mm-hmm. present throughout the plot and he does yes. do things. And he like, at the end, he's like telling the cops to, he, he's the one who's like, uh, how can you tranquilize... <laughs> Him. Mm-hmm. That doesn't make any. If he's a robot, well, uh, he he's very active. I think in what you were touching on earlier, Eric, like I think I'm more impressed by the father's characterization because I don't, mm-hmm. I don't, and maybe I'll disagree. I don't ever feel like that that Sheriff Black is embarrassed by his son. There is a moment where he tells him like. I don't know what the exact line is, but it's like, like, don't be like this right now. But I never get the feeling it's because he's ashamed of his son's queerness. It's more so it's mm-hmm. like, hey, look at the people around you. Watch out for yourself type thing. That is how I feel as well. Yes. Right. Yeah, because he also, I think that happens near near the end of the film when Byron is trying to buy time so that Tammy and Michael right. can get away. And he's basically saying, like, don't give them an excuse to arrest you. We also need to note, this is a black character in a predominantly white movie, so there's a racial connotation to being arrested for this character as well. And he doesn't die in this movie either. I, yeah, I well, know, the violence the is never one. even really threatened against him, which no. I enjoy. No. Not that, like, a queer character should just be safe in a horror setting, but, like... um yeah, he, he's he's having an all right time comparatively. Mm-hmm. But I guess I, I, let, let's say he had died in the end of this movie for some. I would have been reason. furious. Well, but but <laughs> but I, I I agree. He doesn't need to die. However, no. I, I I wouldn't have felt like his character was a waste if he had died at the end of this movie. 
Same, but like the sacrificial black guy is such a yeah yeah. For I don't sure. need it. I'm not saying I want him to die. <laughs> no, 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 no. But like, even if he had, I I would still like the representation. I'm just really glad they didn't because that would have tainted it for me. Yeah, for me, it's the amount of screen time he gets that sets him apart. Like, he's a funny, sassy black gay friend, and we've seen that a number of times before. But usually, they get used in a moderate dose, right? Yeah. Like this is not their story. They're not very important. They come in, they drop a one liner, they walk away. Byron actually feels like a proper character in this narrative. He never disappears. He's there all the way through the film, and that to me is the big kind of exception. And he doesn't exist in a vacuum. Like he, like there isn't just a like, gay person there saying things that has no relationship to anybody else other than the right. main girl. Yep. That's huge because that usually the gay best friend is just like they know the girl. Everybody else just kind of like stops while they say their one line and then they yeah. continue on with the movie but we mm-hmm. know his home life we know i don't i like him well enjoy i think it's important that you're saying too like he stays with her throughout the movie because i feel like in a lesser film he would you know he'd send her off on her way with michael and mm-hmm. we never see this character again yeah exactly yeah yeah and i think it's interesting that we're kind of bookending the month to a certain extent with these gay best friends. And it's like, we saw it with JC in night of the creeps right. where that has a much more traditional outcome. And he really is there to further the hetero normative. So y'all agenda. are settled on JC just being gay. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, 100%. yeah. I, I, I read him as gay. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. No, he's in love. Yeah. You're, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just cause it's not text text. No, no. Yeah. I mean like, yeah, I mean, obviously, Byron is explicitly gay in this movie, whereas JC is yes. not explicitly gay in. They the say it out. Uh, what was the <laughs> later in the morgue when she's like, "I'm not interested in her," and he's like, "I'm not either." <laughs> 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 but this is sad. <laughs> yeah, uh, I can't. I'm excited to get to that scene. Too. Yeah. Well, let's take a step closer to it. So, um, yeah, so we do get the stuff where the two police officers are are mocking of him. And we do realize that his dad is the sheriff. We haven't said he's played by J.J. Saunders. And great uh, name. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> like the first J is an initial and then J, the actual name. And then yep. Saunders. Crazy. Mm-hmm. I love it. <laughs> oh, also, I love these cops that are like, you want me to slap the girl for you, sheriff? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Like, if you didn't realize that they were bad cops, bad people, it's like yeah. everything that they're saying and doing is bad. No, they could have died. They could have died. They could, sure. Yeah, they could have died. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we cut to the next morning, and this is where Helga discovers Carl's completely flattened Judge Doom level body. Okay, I'm I, not to bring back <laughs> Leprechaun again, but mm. there is, so this effect. Oh, and Leprechaun in space. Yes, because yeah. there's a part in Leprechaun in space where the, 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 the science the henchman, he, yeah, by a pizza pan. And it, Ooh, it no. No, here's the thing, it looks good, but it, it's almost like a Looney Tunes type effect where his head is sure. flattened. But when I was a kid watching the TV edit of this on UPN, it's not gory. So you, I saw this guy's flattened head, it scared the fuck out of me. So mm-hmm. this Carl's flattened body, yeah, it's like Judge Doom meets this fucking Leprechaun 4 guy, and it looks so gross. <laughs> I really do. Gross. And I love it that we don't just leave it there. We have to watch Helga drag it inside. <laughs> oh, it's so good. I, I she's really good at dragging it. Because so uh, it, oh, yeah. it looks like it's heavy. So she's like, dra- yeah. she's like, ugh. I'm surprised she's not like, oh, <laughs> just like come back on the, on the cupcakes, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Helga just seems really happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> I really, I want to understand. Oh, she's a, she just wants to have sex with them and she'll do whatever, I guess. Well, and she's a bit of a sadist because she doesn't seem yeah. to be at all bothered by any of this the gore, violence. any of this death. Yeah, like she kind of gets off on it. Well, she's great. <laughs> <laughs> say a million times. I'm just going to say it over and over. Yeah. So Helga and Wackenstein make this plan that they're going to find Michael by keeping an eye on Tammy, who meanwhile has been abducted by Michael via her window slash meteor. Um, I also love that when, whenever he takes her, um, the dad is downstairs and he's like, the mom's doing the blender and the dad just goes, oh, good. Well, at least she's up and around. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know she doesn't like to be disturbed. Um, yeah. Okay, but but this is this is leading into the charade scene, and I'm going to tell mm-hmm. you, I know that this scene is stupid and stupid and silly and whatever. It's the funniest yes. part of the film. But, oh, but Trace is with me on this. I see where this is. Headed. Yes, because I think Denise Richards sells the fuck out of this. Yeah. Scene. Mm-hmm. 
I did not cry, Eric, but I'm not mm-hmm. even saying there's like a defense type thing, but I, I, I was moved by this scene. It's for me, it's the second time she's like, she's like, you have Michael's brain. She figures it out. And then the second <laughs> one where she's like, you have Michael's brain. Yes, yes. I go, oh no. And that's when I get got. She's, I love that he eats the yellow rose too, to make it very oh, clear. It's really cute. <laughs> <laughs> and then, But then to make sure the audience knows it's fu- like, obviously it's funny, but they cut to that stupid wide shot just to remind you how silly this all is <laughs> of her hugging the dinosaur I, uh, great good movie it's uh th- yeah th- i i think this is a legitimately good scene like i don't know how you make this not i mean again it is ridiculous but i don't yeah. feel mm-hmm. ridiculous being moved by it and like joe said it's it's very very funny too it's a it's a, the perfect encapsulation of everything this movie can be yeah I, it's absolutely. very funny sincere it's great i agree mm-hmm so she ends up returning home uh, because, of course, the police have been called. Her parents are very worried. She writes it off and then she tells Byron and she's not at all upset, which is a very big tip off. So she and Byron end up hashing this out. OK, this is what's happening. And he's firmly on board with her immediately. He's like, yeah, I've also seen a dinosaur. I know what you're talking about. Um, this is also so there is one line from the sheriff, too, where because um, when Byron walks up to him, the sheriff says, it's tough enough being with these yokels without you being here, Byron. And Byron snaps back, you know, thanks for the for the vote of confidence, dad. But again, I don't read this as a um, Byron, you're gay. Get out of here. I, I read it more as like, Byron, you're a lot right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is a lot be partly he because he is gay. Uh, so sure. that is still an element. But I do. I, I don't know. I love them. Yeah. Well, I feel like Sheriff Black is, as we've hinted, he's very protective of Byron. So yes. when Byron is there, you get the impression that his attention is divided between what he needs to do to solve cases and keep his stupid officers in line, but also look out for his son, who he knows is being targeted with like anti gay slurs. Mm-hmm. Yes. A hundred percent. The read the roominess of the sheriff's tone is for Byron's defense, 100%. not because he's embarrassed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we cut to the funeral, and Michael is once again just kind of hovering on the periphery, <laughs> watching things. Okay, they really needed one of the extras to notice him or something. I'm sorry, that could have been so fucking funny. He is quote unquote hiding behind a bush. <laughs> yep. His whole head <laughs> watching his own Very funeral. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I would actually argue that this is another moment. It's not quite on par with the previous moment that we just talked Mm -hmm. about with Tammy in the hayloft. But, you know, his Uncle Bob is delivering this really heartfelt, sad eulogy. And it's also extremely hysterical that this dinosaur is crying (laughs) and nodding when his uncle says you know and i'm a drunk and the dinosaur goes "Mm -hmm, oh my god yeah no but but that's the thing i think again the the t-rex exhibits a lot of personality in this film but yeah this like i actually feel like the t-rex is emoting here and not just because there's liquid oozing out of its eyes (laughs) but it it is different from the barn scene in that i think the uh the sincerity of the scene and the comedy are fighting against each other more so than working in tandem but i still think the scene is sweet and uh very funny at the same time oh yeah so. mm-hmm. and then of course we get helga coming into the proceedings so she's wearing a she cheetah outfit amazing. she's eating strawberries <laughs> <laughs> Wait, she, she's got this like this cheetah print leotard but then like a black veil just to make it a funeral appropriate <laughs> mm-hmm. what shania twain would wear a hundred percent a hundred percent And then, yeah, we also have Tammy in her, oh, I'm pretending to be sad, but I'm actually going to Medieval Times dress. And she looks exquisite, but she's really there because they need to get Michael's body before he is buried. Okay. Except that it's already (laughs) completely eaten by Megan. In this metal coffin. (laughs) This, okay, so there's a lot of good, like, oh, open up the coffin, see what's inside. I mean, my mind goes immediately to, like, Bride of Chucky when they find Charles Lee Ray's skeleton or or Driving to Hell when she does, you know, Mm -hmm. Mrs. Giggs at Mrs. Ganish. But there's something so funny about the reaction to this and then the cut to like all these maggots but then not only that we get like the you think the joke's over and then rats like crawl out of his chest yes. and like latch mm. onto her dress <laughs> i'll go ahead and say this is my favorite oh god a body it's funny yes <laughs> scene in any movie ever it's it, it, it her her and byron are just both so funny 
The reactions are really good. They feel real. Because if they were playing it like, I'm going to be over the top to be funny, it wouldn't work. Well, because, but also makes it, so, again, this is actually some good cinematography too, because, so, you know, her and Byron <laughs> fight and she, he's, she's like, fine, I'll fucking do it. And she goes down and then right before she opens it, we get this POV shot from inside the grave. Yes, it looks really mm-hmm. good. And we have Byron, but then, but then Michael the T-Rex walks up and we also get to see Michael react to seeing his decomposed maggot rat. <laughs> ridden by <laughs> it's kind of like he's screaming with them yes! he, like it's it's really funny I, I could be misremembering i feel like he raises his arms up to cover his eyes but he can't because they're Can't-re-tum. too small he doesn't have a reach, yeah. it's the problem with those t-rex arms man. <laughs> this is like one of my favorite like we're a trio of friends in a movie yeah ever like you have your funny gay, you have your dinosaur, and you have <laughs> Richards. It's right. perfect. All of your stock characters. It's so good. <laughs> and, and they get the one up on both Wachenstein, or I, I think I've said his name different every time, and Helga. Okay. That's part of the I don't the know his name. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Dr. V. Dr. V. But I it's a that. W. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's the joke. It's a vodka chaser. Oh, my God. <laughs> I okay so I appreciate that both of you found the maggot ridden rat reveal very funny I was a little underwhelmed I like the physical comedy of like three different people ending up in this grave oh yeah (laughs) it's very sitcom-y but I love it (laughs) (laughs) it's so stupid I don't even know how they all fit in there Okay, but but this is even leading to one of the more funny images in this movie, which is when they steal the truck that Helga and Valkenstein oh. came in, and you just see the T-Rex head sticking up out of the back of it. It's so mm-hmm. cute. I, that's another big part. Like, I just, this whole movie is so cute to me. I like... Well- I, I kind of love it, though, because Michael wouldn't understand how big he is. He no. would still feel like he's human size. So he wouldn't realize, oh, I should be trying to duck my dinosaur body so that I don't stick out so much. Never mind the fact that the animatronic dinosaur is probably not capable of bending no. down. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> Just get down on your on your little T-Rex arms, kind of. Oh, man. I, I, you know, I want to know what theme park it was in Texas this dinosaur went to, because I would love to see if it exists somewhere. I'm, I'm sure it's done, it's gone by now, but still. It's in the back cave of someone. Mm-hmm. That's a joke, because there's a dinosaur in the back cave, but... Is, is that... Wait, I don't get that joke. You're the one who's read all these Batman comics. You've never seen that Bruce Wayne has a dinosaur in the back cave? Oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I killed that one. <laughs> Oof. Moving on. It wasn't my best joke. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, so we head to the morgue because we're going to go body shopping because obviously Michael's body is no longer an option. Um, but what, 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 what else is funny than the T-Rex blowing a kiss back to Tammy? <laughs> oh, no. It's so cute. It's so cute. I love that, like, the second she knows it's Michael, they are just as in love as oh, they were. Oh, it's so lovey dovey. It really. No, it's like my favorite thing. I, I oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's like over the top teen romance where i mean maybe this is why he said i love you because these two are so infatuated they with each love other each other really and do. you can feel it feels like they're really in love i mean look when we get to the end we're gonna, these two are meant to be together they, they, they I, I believe they are still together to this day <laughs> oh sure. yeah He's got that old brain and she's gotten old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she is so picky about his body later, but she very clearly mm. loves him mostly for his mind because he is just a brain later. I I will <laughs> say, okay, look, so here's the thing. I, I enjoy this shopping of the bodies thing. I I get that it's a it's joke. It's the part that has not aged particularly well. Like it's very fat phobic, misogynistic, kind of gently racist. The pe- but well, the penis they... size thing too. I mean, look, oh, oh, oh my God, that's... I sound like an asshole, right? I'm like, nothing, none of that bothers me, but I hate that she's like so picky about the penis size. <laughs> no, that's a great joke. What gets uh, me is if if their one liners in that scene weren't so good, I'd maybe agree. But I love like like this whole scene is so good to me. Oh, and especially since Byron is so fine with the penis size, he's like, he, he is perfect. And she says, nah. <laughs> well, so wait, I, I mean, Eric, she's a, maybe a virgin too, so. Oh, she's Eric, so funny. Wait, so, so wait, do y'all think the joke is that the penis is too big or that the no. penis is too Well, no, okay, no, 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 Eric, <gasps> don't say that because when we watch this t- together, I remember you were like, oh, I always thought the penis was too big. That's why Byron liked it and she yeah. didn't. 
Oh, that's a hundred percent the joke. I thought I remembered the opposite, and I thought I felt the opposite. Oh, I, I thought the joke was the penis was too small. I, that's what I think the joke is. Oh God! Oh, I think it's the other way. Maybe. Oh God! That's why. That's why Byron is excited by it. Listeners, write us in. <laughs> is the penis? Is the corpse's penis too big or too small for Denise Richards? <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. I also my well my favorite line in this whole thing because they that he is bringing up different races. Mm-hmm. And it's off screen, but Byron says, I hope this isn't a racist thing. And she says, no, he just wants someone cute. (laughs) But also the black corpse is really cute. Yeah, but the thing is, she's a teenager and that's like a 40 year old man. Yeah. So I I do like though, so he doesn't even consider the black corpse, but he does consider the female corpse. Yo, I love that. (laughs) <laughs> like the little hand movements too where he's like ah, yeah, maybe it's so good I, waving it away it's it's uh, it's a good scene <laughs> it's very dumb it's all very very dumb it's yeah. something <laughs> um okay so while this is all happening helga and vakenstein are getting out so they're getting away and the police are arriving so we need to hightail it out of the morgue and we just pack Michael into the truck and we speed away so that we can have a high speed chase. I do love that Michael flips off the cops. And oh, yeah. also that we get this fellatio joke from Helga. Oh, chew my rope. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> Helga, chew my rope. And she's like, oh, das doctor. Oh, you know who she reminds <laughs> me of is Frau Blucher from uh, Young Frankenstein. Uh, oh, yeah. I see that. I, she reminds me of, did you guys ever watch the live action Thunderbirds movie? what no. that exists oh there's a live action thunderbirds movie and there, there's a uh, to, to bring something like that <laughs> well it, was, it, came, it came out at the right time for me to be a child to see bill paxton is in it but the um the the evil guy's secondhand person is a woman who is wearing like skin tight leopard print and then the joke is that she's had she has bad teeth which is not great but the um <laughs> but she reminds me of this girl a lot Oh, yes. I'm sorry. One of the most notorious box office bombs ever made. Yes. Uh, but I saw it in the theater and it's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> there you go. That's cool. <laughs> I mean, you've heard a lot of other things that Eric has said as well. <laughs> <laughs> My <laughs> reputation. Oh, I don't have her. I don't have her. Children of the Corn 2022. I mean, 2020. Thumbs up. <laughs> I mean, 2020. I think everybody should at least watch it. I'll, I'll stand by that. We oh, said in our always. Patreon episode, it was funny. It's a funny it's movie. It's funny. But also, like, the two lead girls are acting their asses off. It's great. Uh, Ooh, agree to disagree. <gasps> well, no, no. They are oh, acting their asses acting off just to great. varying degrees yes, of success. There we go. <laughs> I, there we go. Yes. They're, they're putting an that. effort. They're putting an effort to their asses off. Yes, God, they're, they're putting the E in effort because that's what grade I would give the acting of the main girl. Yeah. <laughs> oh, bless her heart. Oh, okay. No. okay. So yeah, what good. do we what do we think of this near F slur joke from Norville or Neville as oh. we're doing the high speed chase? I mean, it's not great. This is one of those. It was 1994 moments right. for me. Yeah, I don't like it, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they don't they don't actually say it no, which is no. something like i mean because because honestly here's the thing though i would expect a movie in the 90s to use that word mm-hmm. and that we don't get that in this movie um I mean, again there are other homophobic jokes in this movie but i'm a little surprised that we don't get the f slur and if they were to drop it like i i, I would have been come back from yes it's hard to come back from and there, there's like it's one thing when like a guy a straight guy is calling another straight guy and they're just being like a douche or whatever but when you call an actual gay character that i, mm-hmm. I would have been to like, his fucking father yeah, that you're on the radio with. i i, I would have wanted the father to kill him uh oh that's a good ending for that storyline actually yeah actually <laughs> like even... like like sheriff black just gets fed up and he's like fuck you and just bops them both on the head <laughs> Ugh, it was a friendly fire they got in the way of us uh, shooting the dinosaur and then they both tragically die I that's a t-rex claw it. hole in their forehead that's not a bullet <laughs> hole <laughs> yeah very yes. specific very tiny if they were to have said the word i would have very much wanted the father to kill them and i don't yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think this is the closest to me that the movie comes to. It's walking right up to that line where I just think, no, you don't need to go here. This isn't a joke, and it's not. And they didn't. So yeah, and they, and they did. Yeah, <laughs> they did. Yeah. Uh, 
I would have excised it, but you know what? That's fine. Yeah. yeah. But but this is when we get another long shot of Tammy riding this T-Rex. Amazing. <laughs> oh my God. And, Amazing. Yeah. and the, 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 this is where the, um, the fire this is where comes the fire in. is really coming yeah. into play. <laughs> yeah. So Eric, do you have experience with the Santa Ana winds and like the fires and shit? I do. I saw a fire just the other, not in, uh, in that area, but I just saw a fire the other day on the way to Burbank. Uh, but there's there are some heavy winds and we get lots of fires and sometimes they go out of control and it can make for good cinematography apparently <laughs> in low budget film. <laughs> but, yeah. but, but what you're saying is that normally in a film shoot if there are fires happening, oh yes, you you leave, you leave. <laughs> you leave. You don't keep shooting for hours at a time. <laughs> and what happened here, dear listeners, is that yeah, Stuart Raffle was like, uh, no, the sky looks beautiful. We're gonna keep shooting. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if somebody had gotten hurt, he definitely would have been in the wrong. Ooh. Uh, but like, oh man, the shot where you can see the uh, Tammy looks behind yeah. her, mm -hmm. and it's like a red sky. It looks like the Tyrannosaurus times. Yeah, mm -hmm. it looks amazing. It's very Not beautiful. Not to be okay with dangerous filmmaking but like it looks really good it does yep and the shot earlier <laughs> went before we see the tyrannosaurus for the first time they show a shot of the sun covered in right. fire smoke and it is red and it is very pretty <laughs> and this is it's a cool looking movie yeah look at that yep <laughs> yep we're, we're allowed to say because no one got hurt yes. so it looks great if somebody had have gotten injured it'd be like yeah, okay. we would at least, at the very <laughs> least, qualify it. Well, yeah. it, it would be, oh, it looks great, but it maybe wasn't exactly worth it. No. <laughs> uh, okay, so yes, uh, Tammy rides Michael away back to the barn, and this is where Byron finds her the next day. But, oh no, he's been trailed by the police officers, mm -hmm. as well as Wackenstein and Helga. And this is where we stage our climax with a big old shootout. Okay, but I do love, I think it's one of the deputies. It's like, it's that crazy doctor, that lanky bitch again. <laughs> Does say lanky bitch. Yep. <laughs> she looks amazing. One of Denise's Richards, like where she actually remembered something in her interview was that she thought Helga looked great. And she asked her how she looked so great. Mm -hmm. And she ended up getting the same Pilates instructor. Yep. And it was yep. like a nice little carryover because she does look great. Not lanky. I mean, the body is fucking great. I it's um, yeah. G good on Helga. <laughs> I real. Oof. <laughs> so I, I, I don't like, I mean, look, I, I think this climax is fine. It's not my favorite part of the movie because it's just like a typical standoff. I wish, I wish we had yeah. a few more deaths on that cop side, as we've already mentioned. Um, I do kind of like Wackenstein's death um, because it looks mm -hmm. so bad. <laughs> Yeah, there's something hasty about this. Like we were well, running I think out of money or running out of time. We're running out of time. Climax is outside where the dinosaur is not. Probably because they only had a week and a half to film it. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine how many days that party scene took. So yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, actually, I'm curious, Eric. I mean, and maybe you don't know, but like, if, if you're schedule, if you're producing and scheduling something like this, would you do the scenes with the most number of actors first and whittle your way down to scenes with the fewest amount of actors, or would you do it in reverse? Um, it, 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 that necessarily wouldn't account for anything in scheduling, especially since extras are usually handled with like, like you get an extras company and they're just like, what they do you need all your extras? Uh, it, gotcha. it, it's very. That that's actually very simple and doesn't affect scheduling too much, unless they were all name characters who could mm -hmm. only be there for like if if Wendy could only be there Tuesday and Thursday, that whole thing. Right. But since it's mostly extras, that wouldn't have affected scheduling. Gotcha. Aside from how many days do we need to shoot yeah. the dinosaur killing people? It mm. could have been a location issue as well. So they yeah. might have had certain locations for only a certain period of time. And as a result, certain things had to be condensed. Oh, yeah. I'm really confused about the permitting for this movie. Because if we're doing this like within a month of the shoot, like how, who, what strings had to be pulled? Or were we just <laughs> shooting illegally in some of these places? Oh, I think I think they were sneaky a lot. Like oh, that party is set behind someone's house, but that house is not always in the shot. So right. for that, you can just be in some field by some woods mm. you don't have to be in a location where you are bothering anybody right or in a warehouse for most of the they're, they're very careful with specifically the dinosaur stuff i'd imagine the house is not a set but denise richard's room where the dinosaur peeks his head in might have been a set mm -hmm. probably it was probably all very well planned and probably for the most part permitted because los angeles sucks to film in i know it, it didn't <laughs> used to suck as much like you could, you had a little more freedom, 
but people don't film here as much as they do in the 80s because hmm. it, it costs so much it got tougher yeah <laughs> yeah um all this to say we shoot this dinosaur dead or so we would think and tammy has a good old cry over its body it's sad too when she because she really thinks Yo. she's lost him at this point like th- this is very effective <laughs> she's lost the love of her life twice and she has yep. sold it both times and she really thought she had him back okay but the faint in the beginning though was pretty good <laughs> it's really oh it's amazing <laughs> like she just like drops to the floor <laughs> It's very good physical comedy from both her and Byron. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I, I called it a coda in my notes. I don't really know if that applies, but we pick back up at a time undisclosed. We don't know if this is weeks or months or whatever, but all of a sudden Tammy is very happy as she returns back home. She runs right past her parents all the way up to her room so that she can speak to camcorder michael who has his brain in this green goo again and Mm -hmm. okay so here's the thing i get that they're teenagers so i should feel like this is kind of inappropriate but right i think this is a very sweet scene (laughs) i think it's sweet except for the fact that denise richards is so young and so to me this outfit the striptease it feels slightly lecherous and male gazy from like a directorial point of view. But when you look at it in the context of the film, it is very sweet where she's like, I'm a teenage girl and I want to get my boyfriend all horned up. I yeah. agree that it is sweet. And I also agree that since this scene is mostly from Michael's point of view and she True. is addressing him as, uh, hey, you, I'm going to make you. They filmed this for people to watch and masturbate to right for sure she's addressing you directly and looking at you it's crazy it's the original pov porn <laughs> yeah yeah but even us as gay men though like i find this again i find oh, this no, very I like charming in a way I like, like i like it <laughs> and granted yes i mean luckily Denise Richards was 23 when she filmed this movie or 22 i think but like nevertheless and this is a teenage girl doing a strip tease a burlesque dance strip tease mm-hmm. for her brain of a boyfriend um but i don't know it's who is exploding a, it's such a happy... watching it well i i love that it's a happy ending though because i mean look yeah. honestly if literally it, if this... a happy ending because those sparks equal ejaculate Oh, he 100% comes in at the end of it. The, the, the movie ends with this brain coming. It is yeah. so And funny. the confirmation that they just found some frozen skiers who are right. dead that they can put a brain into. And yes. he says, I love skiing. But it's one of those things where like the situation is so ridiculous. And again, it's kind of a thing where it's like, oh, like if this is a normal quote unquote movie, I would expect her to be like, well, I got to move on. But like the fact that she's like, she's so in love with him that she's willing to do this for him when he's just a brain camcorder. I'm just oh, like, 100%. that's so sweet. I do not need a griefy ending in a movie. No. On. This isn't Spider-Man. Where's the trauma? <laughs> no, none of that here. Please. So I don't know. I, I, and that's the thing. Like, I just I, I find this movie so joyous. I think it's such a fun, happy movie. And as you said, Joe, very in on the joke. Like I just I did not expect this when I watched this for the first time. I expected something that was meant that was bad, but unintentionally so. And I got something that I just thought was very self-aware and very sweet. Mm-hmm. I love it a lot. too. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> So my prompt for the two of you is that if we could ever get a hypothetical sequel where we get to catch up with Tammy and Michael, but they haven't managed to make the body thing work, what else would you like to see Michael in? Ooh. Well, first off, a villain definitely needs to go. Helga's still available. Helga needs to come back. What Helga comes back. But because the work, because obviously Paul Walker died 10 years ago, but th- that's mm-hmm. where the body switching works, yes. right? You don't even need his voice. If you have another mm-hmm. body of something, you could just have a different voice for him. Correct. Um. Well, what's something modern? I mean, like, I'm, I'm done. With, uh, I mean, here's the thing. Do you want to keep it, like, in the animal factory or... Do you want like another piece of tech? Is it not a piece of tech? I don't. I don't know. I mean, realistically, it would be a piece of tech, right? If we're <laughs> it has to have, be some kind of tech, but it could still anything that has like right. batteries or wires or fair. what? What if it was one of those <laughs> vibrator? Vi- what was it? What if it was one of those vibrators, but like the the Halloween theme ones, where it's like an <laughs> alien or a predator <laughs> vibrator? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so the T Rex vibrator. It's tricky because I actually I, I would love a sequel. I'm trying to think like what in RoboCop two, mm-hmm. <laughs> they 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 get they they're make a new worse robocop that the villain goes in and so i would like michael back in maybe there's another dinosaur like some other like a velociraptor or something right 
<laughs> more her size, but she could still ride it because they do that in the Jurassic World, so we know it can happen. Oh God! Uh, which yeah, the, and taming and taming the T Rex is much better in the Jurassic World. Just to go on the record for that. <laughs> um, yeah, more hot takes. I would I would probably agree with that. Yeah, because it's like actually good. <laughs> um, Watchability factor is high. Yeah. Yes, I, yes. Uh, you you put on taming the T Rex at a party with friends. You don't put on any of the Jurassic World movies at a party with friends. <laughs> no, no, you do not. Oh man. Um. Uh, well. Okay. Well. That that is Tammy and the T Rex. Um. Do, do, does anyone have any final thoughts on this movie before, before we wrap out? Um. Denise Richards is perfect, and so is the rest of the cast and the crew. <laughs> 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 Great movie. It's a perfect, <laughs> it's perfect. movie. <laughs> uh, yeah. Justice for Denise Richards. I think. Yeah. I think Denise Richards is. I. I. I don't want to say this is her best performance because I think that no. does discredit the work she does no. after this film. But I do think this is a really, really good performance from Denise Richards. Like, genuinely good performance. It is so cathartic hearing you say that. Like, The World Is Not Enough is my favorite James Bond movie. It's and so I've, ha- I've had to defend it and her my entire life. Well, she finally recently came out saying how horrible the treatment for her was in the media for that movie. Yeah, yeah I, 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 agree. I agree. I I don't think she's, like, a great Bond girl, but, like, I, I, she's well, far the, from and the there's, worst. There is a perfect Bond girl in that movie as well, yeah, too. Yeah, oh, It's the only... James Bond movie good. with a female main villain. She's the one with the plan and everything. I love her. I love Electra. Ah, she, she's this. fantastic. And Denise Richards is like a campier 70s Bond girl, which is fine. And yeah, most yeah. of the poor line readings people point to are ADR, which is not on actors, I believe, that is on the right. ADR. 100%. Yeah. yeah. It's very moonraker y. So. Hmm. Yeah. And so I, I support and I love. And she's great. Trust and me. also Siobhan Durkin. Uh, why, why haven't you been in a movie for 20 years? If it was to raise kids or anything like that, you're done now. Come back. Come back. <laughs> God, I miss you. Make another leprechaun. Oh Come on. <laughs> All right. But, well, before we announce what we're covering next week, which um, <laughs> a movie that's shockingly similar to this one, um, oh. Eric, <laughs> first, thank you for coming on to this and discussing this with us. But let everyone know, where can they find you on social media? Well, thank you so much for having me. I've had the time of my life talking about Taming <laughs> the T-Rex. Um, I'm, I'm a Twitter boy. <laughs> you can find me at Eric Lawrence, E-R-I-C-K-L-O-R-I-N-C on old Twitter.com, uh, unless it doesn't exist anymore because, you know. Yeah. Well, we got that new CEO, so maybe everything's going to go back to the That'd be fucking nice. Uh, I never go on Instagram, but, like, if you message me, I'll see it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm around. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, if you want to get in touch with us, you can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at HorrorQueers. Shoot us an email at HorrorQueers at gmail.com. Find us on Letterboxd to keep track of all the films we've covered. Go to our YouTube channel to check out our interviews with various horror filmmakers, as well as the new horror releases we are most excited for each month. And if you want to chat with other listeners, please join our Facebook Horror Queers group. If you have a moment, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And if you want even more content, please support the show by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash horrorqueers. Today is the last day of May, so while we will not be revealing our June Patreon schedule yet, go sign up now and you will get up to 242 hours of extra content. This month, we went all in on the Evil Dead franchise with an episode on Evil Dead Rise, our thoughts on the Evil Dead franchise as a whole, and an audio commentary on the original 19. 81 film. Plus, we also had episodes on Amazon Prime's Queer as Fuck Dead Ringer series, as well as the sequel, The Wrath of Becky. Mm-hmm. But stay tuned next week for that June schedule. There we go. Joe. Yes. What are we talking about next week? <laughs> All right. Well, we teased it. We haven't talked about it at all this episode, but we did in the outro when we were talking about Tammy and the T-Rex mention that it was the first of two weeks of dinosaur films, Trace. So uh, we're going to go from low budget to high budget and very mainstream, but still dinos. We're going to be talking about the 30th anniversary of Jurassic Park. Oh, boy. Um, Talk about my childhood nightmare fuel. Oh, yeah. There's a bunch of scary shit in here. And trans dinosaurs. There we go. (laughs) All right, everyone. Well, until next week, we can cross out Tammy and the T-Rex. Indeed. Good job, Tammy. And cross out horror queers. Ah,
Atlas Avenue, a long stretch of road that encompasses everything the city of Kennet Heights has to offer. Neon lights, traffic, crime, the hustle and bustle of everyday life, and the craziest of characters. My office was above it all. My name is James Locke, and I'm a P.I. Hello, Mr. J. How the hell you doing today? Good, Edith. Nearly every year I have a new case. New people to meet, new clues to discover, and new problems to solve. But I do it the old-fashioned way. No technology. Nothing post-1950. Hell, I don't even listen to podcasts, but you should. Atlas Avenue Beat is a spoof of the film noir genre with goofy characters, tons of wordplay, and non-stop raunchy humor. There's also three whole seasons out right now with more on the way. Just search for Atlas Avenue Beat wherever you listen to podcasts or visit us online at bloody.fm.